And welcome everyone to the Fox 10 News Now stream. Part right of FoxTenPhoenix.com as we're taking a look here of a winter blast that is happening around the country. Taking a left here, uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, as you're looking at a frozen waterfall. And to the right, Florida getting some nasty weather there right now. A mix of freezing rain, sleet, then snow will blanket areas from North Florida to the coastal Carolinas and Southeast Virginia. Some ice accumulation in North Florida and Southeast Georgia will trigger power outages and tree damage. A blizzard warning has been issued for far northeastern North Carolina and far southeastern Virginia, including Norfolk, Virginia, due to the combination of heavy snowfall and gusty winds, which will likely cause whiteout conditions and significant drifting of the snow. Yeah, well, Amy and Bob, it has been cold here in Chicago for quite some time. I mean, really, yesterday well below zero, okay? And today, we're calling it a warm-up because we're expecting for most of Chicago land area to reach about 16 degrees. Believe it or not, that is about 30 degrees warmer than we've seen, okay? So that should put it all into perspective for you. I want to show you something. We're about 21 miles outside of Chicago right now. We're actually in the area called Western Springs, and there is a little bit of snow coming down right now. We're actually at a commuter rail station. I want you to look at these tracks because one thing you probably have never heard of before, they call it like a heating switch that they install on the track. So just in case snow or ice were to accumulate on those tracks, they're able to warm them up so those trains can move throughout our city pretty easily. So I think that's really interesting. One other thing I want to show you because I heard you say a little bit earlier, I was listening in onto your newscast, you said that those space heaters were selling out and I, I had to laugh only because you're talking about the upper 40s. I know that's cold for you guys, but here, if we were in Chicago, people would be wearing shorts. I'm going to strip down just a little bit. Okay, it's not going to get, you know, this isn't lewd, but I want to show you just, you know, how cold it is here and what we have to deal with because I don't think people sometimes really understand. Okay, this is my old uh, Fox 40 sweatshirt from when I worked at Fox 40 in Sacramento, but the layers are thick. That's a t-shirt, okay? This is like your little snow pants. Most people use these when they go skiing. And then under there, I have a, a whole nother layer of sweatpants and then under there, another layer. I can't show you all, but I have about uh, three pairs of socks on. So when you talk about cold weather, I'm sorry, Florida. I can't really feel too sorry for you guys. I, I just can't. I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> but but the cuter version, the cuter version. Can we go with that? At least the cuter version. <laughs> All right, guys. So, yeah, reporting from, uh, oh, thank you. Reporting from Western Springs here, uh, 21 miles outside of Chicago, Illinois. Tia Ewing, Fox 32 News. I'll send it back to you guys in warm and sunny Florida because you're tripping if you're tripping off of 40 degrees. <laughs> All right, so that was a Fox 32 reporter in Chicago talking to a station in Florida. And she's saying, hey, you guys are dealing with 40 degree temperatures. That's nothing. In Chicago dealing with some temps today, about 15 degrees for a high and negative two for a low.
And how about Delaware? Delaware, yeah, Delaware is uh, kind of a half and half state here. It looks like the southern part of Delaware could really get walloped. And then the northern part is sort of the same situation as Philadelphia with the one to three inches. Delaware is such a long state, you really have to, uh, it depends on where you live in Delaware. But the further south you go, the more chance, let's say south and east of Philadelphia, the more chance you have of seeing decent accumulations of snow. So that's, that's about it for now. I just want to give you the latest information that we have right here in the Weather Center. Uh, and again, uh, Kathy Orr will be taking over very soon. Uh, we're going to keep an eye on things as well and keep you updated on the website, fox29.com, on all of our social media, and of course, uh, tonight on the Fox 29 News. And just uh, we'll, we'll get you through it. And if you got your milk, bread, and eggs, I'm sure. What's uh, probably going to happen over the next 24 hours and really even beyond that because uh, just as much as the snow that's coming from this nor'easter, we have to worry about the wind, especially if you are at the shore. We've got dangerous wind chills coming everywhere. So uh, yeah, things are gonna take a turn for the dramatic in many ways, weather-wise. So of course everybody wants to know about the snow. I was in the Acme yesterday and folks were going crazy and it was stupid, <laughs> just stupid, because uh, you know what, we never are out of commission that long, but that's another lecture for another time. Here's the storm now. Uh, we've got uh, just a mess of rain and snow down in the deep south. Now it hasn't taken on those characteristics of a circular storm around a center yet, but that's supposed to happen as soon as it moves offshore. So we're going to zoom in just a little bit here to show you places that don't usually get snow, like Charleston, South Carolina like Jacksonville and Tallahassee had some snow this morning. Let's see if there's any. There's a Vidalia, Georgia there. Uh, other places in Georgia look like they're way across getting some decent snow there. And other parts of South Carolina or Georgetown probably getting some freezing rain there. And uh, so that's what's going on with that. And we'll advance here and show you our watches and warnings that are in it for right now. We have a winter weather advisory, and that's the counties you see in purple here. So that's the uh, northern part of Burlington, uh, the two counties right across from us here in Philadelphia, Cape May, uh, uh, sorry, Cape May County is down there. That's another story. We've got Cumberland and Salem counties and Kent County in Dover. I meant to say Gloucester and Camden counties. All oh, Anyway, the winter weather advisory, that's for accumulating snow, but not as much as we're going to get at the shore. So in pink here, you see, oh, Ocean County, the southern part of Burlington, and Atlantic, and Cape May, and Sussex in Delaware, all under a winter storm warning. And that's for the possibility of as much as six inches of snow in those areas. Uh, we're, we're going with three to six. I'll show you that map in a moment. Here's a look at the future cast that will uh, show, first of all, I'm going to take you slowly through this. You see the storm starting to get those characteristics I was talking about, the circulation around the center that would be the center so it starts moving up the coast tonight the first snowflakes probably around let's say between 10 o'clock and midnight and uh, mostly along the coastline all those places under the winter storm morning we just showed you now here's six in the morning we see the possibility of some of that snow spreading into our western areas uh, but it's still a real tricky forecast for the infamous I-95 Carter. So uh, we could get a couple of inches of snow. That's the estimate right now. But it does look like it will be out of here by noon. At least that's the way it's shaping up according to that computer model. And we'll uh, stick with that for now. So some of the details about this storm begins late tonight, continues through the Thursday morning rush. So it comes at a very inconvenient time. Uh, the heaviest snow, as we mentioned, at the shore, the least in the northern and western suburbs of Pennsylvania. And it ends, the latest it will end is Thursday evening if it decides. Now, I didn't show these models on TV this morning because I thought they might freak you out. Because the North American model consistently has shown 
the worst case scenario. And then we've got the global model, the European model, with much less as far as snow accumulation is concerned. Makes it tricky with a with a coastal storm. Then it's even more dramatic as we look at the Atlantic City forecast, a couple of inches versus close to a foot of snow. As usual, the truth is probably somewhere in between. So this is what we're going with with snow amounts. And it's pretty much the same as Kathy Orr had last night. Three to six inches along the coast of those winter storm warning counties. One to three inches around the metro area. Maybe closer to the two to three is the way it's looking now. And less than an inch or nothing if you're thinking about the Pocono Mountains. Now we're also uh, looking at a wind chill uh, watch that's been issued for the mountains for uh, Friday and Saturday, Thursday night, Friday and Saturday for wind chills in the mountains that could be as low as 25 degrees below the zero. So the winds are gonna be extreme. It is gonna be extreme cold. We'll probably have some record cold. As soon as the snow ends, the winds kick in and the polar vortex temperatures will be here as well. So, do, uh, Maria, do we have any questions? Maria is there. <laughs> Anybody uh, asking anything? What do we think about school closings? Is that a possibility? Yeah, well, the schools will be watching just as carefully, and, and I think we've all established as a tricky forecast, so I think we'll all be here at 4 o'clock in the morning for Good Day Philadelphia, watching to see what the situation is by then. But what I would do is really make sure to watch Kathy Orr tonight at 5, 6, 10, and 11. I'm not, not just saying that. She'll have the latest computer model information, and she'll have a better estimate. Follow us on social media. Welcome, folks, here to the Fox 10 and News Now stream, part of Fox10Phoenix.com. Coming up in about, oh, 45 minutes, Vice President Mike Pence will be swearing in two Democratic senators today. On the Senate floor, we'll have that for you right here on News Now.
NASDAQ, you know, obviously NASDAQ is at the very forefront of that. NASDAQ historically has been uh, the exchange where startups have gone. Um, so what are the challenges that you're seeing in terms of uh, public companies going public, and, and how is it that, you know, are, are the proxies, you know, some of the proxy issues that Jim was talking about playing a role in that? Yeah, thanks for the question. One thing I'd add to, uh, to the, uh, the bio that you mentioned is that, you know, one of the areas of focus that I've had over the last year is uh, sort of our capital formation policy here in the United States and our blueprint that we published earlier on this year uh, focusing on exactly that topic, right? So uh, not only what are the impacts of you know, the proxy advisory firms, but broadly our, our capital markets ecosystem and, and what gives rise to these quotes. Uh, and you know, for us, it's really you know, two areas of focus. One is you know, how do we create uh, an environment where we can have a healthy job market, uh, where we can create jobs, where we can, uh, from a Slack perspective, where we can create a, a strong environment for, uh, for job growth, and how can we uh, achieve wealth distribution in a way that our public markets historically have done so well. Uh, and so when we talk to um, you know, companies around this, you know, we, we, we observe uh, you know, some of the data is, is very stark. You know, 92% of uh, job growth for public companies occurs post-IPO. So when we hear these, these uh, descriptions of our market, we get very concerned. And we also look at uh, our history in this country where, for example, Microsoft went public. They were, what, $330 million uh, in market cap, and now they're, what, you know, 500 and $78 billion, the B. So that is you know, wealth creation for the public. So you know, our, our observation as we look at this data, of course, yes, it impacts, uh, it impacts the businesses that we run, uh, but it also impacts our ability as an economy uh, to drive job growth and to drive wealth creation. Uh, and so when we look at, for example, the proxy advisory, uh, firms and how they are creating uh, the environment that Slack is describing there, uh, we see really two categories. We see companies that are already in the you know, recently public uh, who, who observe probably three different areas of, of pain, if you will. One is that uh, you know, they, they, they are challenged with costs of uh, both direct costs and indirect costs of uh, sort of working in the environment of the proxy advisory firms, whether that's you know not understanding the uh, the sort of the opaqueness of the process or not uh, being willing to uh, go it alone and and not pay for uh, the advisory services, et cetera. Uh, the second is the uh, the sort of one size fits all, and it was alluded to uh, before by Jim, which is that you know it is the case that most of the recent public companies that you know, come to market are unique. They're creating new businesses, they're innovative, they're reframing the discussions uh, around the markets that they operate in. And so they're very um, frustrated by the fact that the one size fit all, fitting all doesn't map up to their business. Uh, and then the third area of focus is that you know, they do have this observation that as a private company, uh, they have uh, a certain number of rules to live by, and as a public company, they end up being disadvantaged, and they sort of are competitively worse off vis-a-vis -vis their, their peers. And that, that can be uh, a challenge for them if they're uh, thinking about you know, whether to, to jump over the line. Uh, two other comments I would make about the pre-public companies that we work with, and we, we work with uh, hundreds of, we have hundreds of those conversations each week as well, uh, and that those are, I'd probably add two more uh, considerations there. One is that uh, there is a view that the proxy advisory firms are very much more short-term focused than their business plans are. Their business plans tend to be very long uh, in their horizon. They cover decades worth of development and, and business re, uh, reinvention. Uh, and to the extent that there is a disconnect there, that's, that's a concern for a private company uh, looking at uh, a, a capital market uh, entry. Uh, and then the other thing which you hear anecdotally is that 
because of the scale required or the perceived scale to, to required to, to be a public company that uh, companies want to defer and defer and defer and grow and grow and grow until such time as they are a perfect company. Uh, and of course, you know, I think if you interviewed, you know, most CEOs, even, uh, even, you know, long-standing public companies, they'd insist they're not a perfect company, but they're a, uh, a company in the process of perfecting themselves. So if you take out the, the growth curve uh, to, the, to the limit, and these companies continue to grow before going public, then the average investor doesn't get to benefit from the uh, growth of that span. I contrast that to the Microsoft case that I mentioned earlier on. So I'd say those are the sort of the five areas that you know, we see intersecting this, this quote with you know, where the proxy advisory firms sit today. Yeah, it's interesting too because um, when Jay Clayton was here earlier this summer, you know, one of the things he was talking about is that you know, with your Microsoft for the example, companies used to go public here, they're now going public here, and that the retail shareholder is being shut out of getting any of the benefits of that, and that, you know, as he sees it, we have good, robust, plentiful private markets, we should have that, but we've built in a number of inefficiencies with the public market, so it'll be very interesting to see how uh, the SEC sort of sorts through that, because they think they've put that at the top of their agenda. Um, Ted, let me turn to you. Sure. Um, uh, you sort of have a, you have a very unique role, right? You worked at ISS, you, you're now uh, working, you know, uh, with Neary. Um, I had a, you know, unique opportunity last week to go to New York and speak before a group of investment relation officers, you know, to talk about communications. What, you know, when Brian talked about the, um, the proxy advisory firm survey that we released today with NASDAQ, which we've done the last three years, what's been very interesting there, just staying with proxy advice for a second, is that with those three surveys, we've seen consistently that companies are trying to communicate more with the proxy advisory firms, but they're also seeing um, there's still a persistent issue, uh, well, two issues. One is they don't necessarily see that communication um, working. Uh, it's not necessarily a two-way street. Uh, but also that there's a persistent problem with conflicts of interest. Um, what, how do you see you know, proxy advice developing you know, after the 2014 guidance? And you know, Brian talked about the legislation, but do you also see the SEC doing anything further here? Well, that, that, that's an excellent question. I mean, our, uh, NERI's done our own surveys, uh, in it, you know, and you know, our findings have been you know, consistent with what you all have found. Uh, there's, despite the 2014 staff legal bulletin by the SEC, there hasn't been a significant improvement in how issuers are treated by the proxy advisors. I mean, you know, there's been you know, some improvement, and obviously the proxy advisory firms are providing more disclosures to their own clients about their processes. But you, know, you still have a situation where uh, public companies cannot get a draft review, a uh, preview of their report from Glass-Lewis. Uh, they still are clinging to their policy that they're not going to provide that. And ISS only provides that to the S&P 500 uh, uh, companies. And so there's a vast group of uh, small and mid-cap companies that are sort of shut out of this, this process. And uh, often, you know, some of the smaller companies will, will get sort of surprised uh, by a negative ISS recommendation, and and sort of sort of be having to play sort of catch up in in the in the weeks before their annual meeting to try to respond. Well, Neary has raised the issue of proxy advisors for the last several years. We do an annual visit to the SEC every September, and pretty much the staff has pretty much taken the approach that, well, you know, since the the staff legal bulletin they don't seem that inclined to do anything unless companies themselves uh, do a better job of sort of speaking up on their behalves. Uh, when I've talked to uh, the SEC staffer sort of in charge of proxy advisors, he's sort of saying, well, we're not hearing uh, much from individual issuers about their problems with the proxy advisors. So, so one sort of message I would have to everyone is that if you have a problem with your proxy advisor, uh, proxy advisors and, and the way you were treated, don't just tell your institutional investors. I mean, you, you should tell them, but you should also tell the SEC staff as well, because that will finally prod them to, to, to take another look at this issue. My sense is the staff, unless they're directed by new chair Clay, uh, uh, 
the new chairman otherwise is that they view they've sort of checked that box with their staff legal bold and, and are not going to do anything else in this area unless prodded by a, a legislative effort a, such as the, um, the, the, the Duffy bill. Zach, I, I want to get to um, ESG in a second, but um, to stay on proxy advice for one yeah. second, you know, Larry Fink was really, um, I would say, the first one in the institutional investor world who basically said, look, you know, the, the data that proxy advisors can provide us can be important, but we really need to make an independent voting mm -hmm. decision here. Um, and, you know, BlackRock does that, Vanguard, Fidelity, they all have independent voting uh, systems. From BlackRock's perspective, are you seeing, how do you, how are you seeing proxy advice sort of developing or has it gotten better since, you know, the 2014 guidance or is this, you know, are, are you satisfied where things are? Do you think changes need to be made? Sure. So um, I'll just, just quickly, um, in recognition of your comment about Larry's, Larry's comments, we've grown the size of our investment stewardship team at BlackRock from 22 um, people in, uh, through 2015 up to 31 today, so by 50 percent just in the last 18 months. And that's really a reflection of our belief that the, um, that the work of the team, which is an engagement first approach, uh, takes resources, that that is the best way to protect our clients' economic interests when it comes to corporate governance matters. So um, I'll say three, three things about proxy advisors. The first, um, we, it's our belief that the clients of proxy advisors, the institutional investors, are best placed to oversee quality control. We have an annual due diligence meeting with, uh, with our primary proxy advisor, ISS. We have an ongoing, uh, ongoing dialogue throughout the year with them, and we also have ongoing meetings with the other proxy advisors we use. Uh, and when we're positioned as clients to provide market discipline vis-a-vis -vis the, their services. The, um, this discussion of registration or additional regulations, we need to keep in mind that the cost of any incremental regulation is going to be borne by the investors throughout the investor value chain. And we have to question whether the value of any incremental regulation will, um, will correspond to the costs borne by those investors. The other, the other point I would make, turning the lens inward, is that institutional investors are and should be accountable to their clients vis-a-vis -vis their policies, their proxy voting decisions, and in institutional investors should be transparent about those policies and should be transparent about the, the work of their stewardship team, as we call it, BlackRock, or their other respective uh, uh, approaches. And so at BlackRock, we have um, worked to be more transparent. This year, we've articulated, we, we've always had engagement priorities, but we articulated for the first time our set of engagement priorities for the next 18 months. We've, we've long been publishing quarterly commentaries around the engagement work of the team. We have, um, it, this year for the very first time, named a few company names, not because we think name and shame is necessarily an effective approach, but because there is significant client demand for um, more information about how does your engagement work translate to proxy voting decisions? Uh, how are you making your decisions? And so we're, we're meeting our client demand. Why don't you shift over, um, Zach, just um, to talk about um, environmental, social, and governance issues. I mean, Jim gave you know, some pretty interesting charts there about you know, if you take a look particularly with environmental and social shareholder proposals, the, the big number that's there uh, that they continue to dominate the shareholder process. Um, you know, there's also the issue of the gadflies where, you know, you have, you know, three or four investors that, you know, are, are doing the bulk of that. And when we looked at it a few years ago, you know, we decided, you know what, that there is a cost there to both investors and companies. And the way to deal with that is, you know, through the resubmission threshold issues or, and also ownership verification. But what has shifted, what I think caught people's attention last year was with Exxon and Occidental that suddenly there was a climate change proposal that passed in those two companies. Hi, we're on. Okay, is that so something where, you know, traditionally American investors have, when they voted, have decided, you know what, those are not important issues, we're more focused on return. Is, so is what we saw last year, was that an aberration or is this gonna be a trend that's gonna move forward as we're going into 2018. So, uh, and you're speaking specifically about, so BlackRock supported 
shareholder proposals at ExxonMobil and at Occidental Petroleum that uh, essentially asked the companies to provide um, a scenario planning, published scenario planning that would include uh, you know, a, a path whereby the, the Paris Accord goals were, were met, as Jim mentioned. Um, so, so just to, to take a step back, um, you know, we have a policy and approach around uh, environmental or social shareholder proposals. Um, and um, th the bottom line for us is that we have to take an economic materiality lens to our analysis. We have clients that have a wide range of values. Um, and our clients are not necessarily asking us to represent their values in the work of our team. The common denominator across our clients is their um, is meeting their long-term investment objectives and their economic objectives. And we have the fiduciary responsibility to, to help them achieve that. As an aside, if our clients do wish to um, set forth their values and their investments, we offer specific products and solutions, but that's not the work of my team. No, I haven't even so if we look at climate risk, for example, BlackRock has been doing work over the past several years on the investment implications of climate risk, both to our asset owner clients as well as in making active investment decisions. Our BlackRock Investment Institute has published two thought pieces now, one in 2015. This goes back at least two years, the, the work of this group, one in 2016 that represents views from investment stewardship, from our active portfolio managers, from other thought leaders within the firm that seek to address um, some of these issues. What are the regulatory implications for companies and investors? What are the physical implications? What are the economic implications as the cost of renewables comes down over time? This is just an example. So we have had longstanding dialogue with many companies over the past year alone, 80 companies globally on the issue of climate risk. In the US, and by the way, the US is one of the few uh, countries in the world where these issues are tackled through the proxy process. In the US, in this past proxy season, we've also voted on approximately 21 or so shareholder proposals of, of you know, the ilk that I mentioned. Um, the, the longstanding engagement with two companies in this particular year has led to a vote that was different than in previous years. So we should think about that engagement as a trajectory. There's an arc to the engagement. And um, it's not that our position, our, our, our policy position has changed. There's still 19 other companies where we've opposed because we haven't kind of gotten to that point in our dialogue or we said, OK, at this point, we think that we need to also um, communicate to the board through this, through this proxy vote. Um, those votes at those companies could be the same or they could be different if those proposals reappear in the future. I, I don't know. And so that work continues to, to be underway. Um, the last thing I will just, I will just say about, um, uh, about this is that we do encourage, through the engagement work of this team, companies to um, assess, manage, and ultimately report, um, hopefully over time, in a standardized, comparable way, how they think about climate risks within their business, that are relevant to their business. So um, we were part of the 32-member task force on climate-related financial disclosure uh, that the FSB convened. Um, we see that as a starting point for companies. We're not prescribing companies to follow that task force necessarily, but that is a starting point for companies to begin, again, managing, assessing, reporting to shareholders' data so that we can, over time, compare companies and understand the risks related to climate specifically and ultimately protect our clients' economic interests. Randall, let me ask you this question, but you know, Ted and Zach, feel free to jump in as well. Um, one, of the, um, one of the obstacles for companies going public um, has been short-termism, right? That there's short-term decision-making by um, management, um, you know, as an example, Tom Donahue back in 2005 gave a speech up at Wall Street where he, he then was, you know, decrying, you know, some of the short-termism um, activities we were seeing, particularly with quarterly earnings guidance. Are, are you seeing that uh, businesses aren't willing to go public because they're, they're sort of going to have to manage quarter by quarter? and that they feel more comfortable if they're going to stay private, that they can take a longer-term view? What, what are you seeing with that? 
Yeah, I, I think some companies for sure do see their uh, their horizon of impact, if you will, in their business community to be you know spanning decades, and certainly to the extent that they feel feared that. Uh, they're going to have a quarter-to-quarter -quarter look at their business that that could get in the way. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, an interesting bridge to the ESG conversation is that, you know, some of our companies actually see ESG as a, as a path to being long-termist, right? Because a lot of the things that, you know, would be articulated in an ESG or a risk uh, forward, risk uh, visual, uh, framework is going to be over decades. And so that's an interesting way that some companies are uh, being both ESG responsive and long-termist at the same time. But I think to your to the question directly asked, I, I think, you know, for sure, some companies view uh, the ecosystem in which we operate uh, as one that's got a short-term bias. For one thing, I mean, it, not the focus of today's discussion so much, but certainly uh, the fact that short sale uh, disclosure is uh, sort of divergent from long sale disclosure, right? So our our reporting disclosure framework in this country is certainly uh, doesn't have as much visibility on short term uh, on, on short trading, right? And so there are there are many ways in which we see there is a uh, uh, or articulated to us that you know short term bias in the marketplace and in the media and elsewhere does discourage people from going public on a, uh, in cases, yeah. Ted Zach, I don't know if you have a view on that. Yeah, to follow up on that point, just, uh, yeah, no, certainly I, I would agree with Randall. We certainly need to update the disclosure rules for that relate to short selling. You know, currently uh, short position holders are not required to disclose their activities as long position holders are, you know, through the 13F rules. And, you know, that's certainly something that NERI has been active on. Uh, NASDAQ, NYC, all filed rulemaking petitions in this area. And you know it's something that's getting getting more attention, and we hope the SEC will will, will take 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 a look at these issues as well. From a, I think many of our members still feel uh, there is the quarterly pressure. Some of them uh, stopped doing quarterly uh, guidance after the financial crisis because of the difficulty. And but many of these companies have reverted back to providing uh, short-term guidance. And even though there has been a greater emphasis on long-termism and promoting that. Uh, no company sort of wants to be the only one in their industry sector who is not providing uh, guidance. You know, nobody sort of wants to be the outlier there and, and you know, have, have try to explain that to their investors. So certainly, uh, you know, there's, we've heard proposals about moving to uh, making quarterly reporting optional as it is in the, in the UK. But I think from a standpoint of most IR professionals, is something where unless everybody else was doing it, they would be reluctant to do that, you know, be the only one, you know, moving to, uh, you know, reporting twice, twice a year. And certainly from a guidance standpoint, our members' viewpoint is that, you know, they want to have the flexibility to provide short-term guidance if they want to. But, you know, I agree with Randall's point that I think ESG and the greater interest there is something that, you know, will help encourage long-term, more to long-term as well. And I would just add, I think I think we're we're quite a, quite aligned here. I mean, the whole reason that we focus on uh, ESG, and really we think about uh, E and the S, the environmental and social aspects, as a function of the G. A well a well managed, well led company will manage the relevant environmental and social aspects of its business. Uh, but the reason we're focused on this is our clients are long term locked in investors, either because they invest in our index tracking funds or because they've told us that they're investing for long-dated liabilities or long-dated um, you know, retirement plans. Um, and it is over the longer term that these types of issues typically manifest as financial for companies. Um, I, I would also just, just echo what you say on earnings guidance. Um, we, we understand the sensitivities that companies face in deciding whether or not to provide earnings guidance. I think Companies can can provide other other types of guidance. They have to be focused on quarterly EPS. They can provide guidance on more strategic me uh, measures. You can look at it over different time frames, and we would certainly welcome um, flexibility in that regard. Um, no one's brought up hedge fund activism, but clearly that is that is one aspect of the the discussion around pressures on public companies. Um, in our view, on the one hand, um, activism 
can have a disciplinary effect on underperforming companies and, and at the margins can provide benefits to investors. On the other hand, we, we, we do meet with companies regularly who um, are performing well and are targeted by activists nonetheless. Um, and so, um, you know, maybe, maybe just one, one thing I will say in that regard is um, to the extent that hedge fund activists purport to know the views of BlackRock or other institutional investors, do not believe that. They will, they will know our views whenever the vote comes in. <laughs> um, short of that, the company are the only ones that will, will ever know our views. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. On the the uh, periodicity of, of reporting and the style of reporting, you know, I think this goes back to the theme of one size not fitting all, which we'd mentioned before. I mean, I think that, you know, our view is certainly the, the view that we ascribe in our uh, in our revitalized blueprint is that, you know, companies will have a right answer, but not every company will have the same right answer. So if you talk about, you know, the diversity of companies that are represented in the United States, there's some that, you know, are, you know, pre-revenue biotech companies and they're doing a quarterly earnings report is, you know, is, is at best a, a vehicle just to, to sort of you know, create you know, process uh, and and maybe maybe arguably some uh, some increased you know uh, job security for some in the uh, in the adjacent industries. But you know, I think that you know compare that to let's say a retail uh, operation that is accustomed and whose investors are accustomed to getting same source sales data. You know, you, the investors will answer this question, right? It wouldn't necessarily, it, you certainly wouldn't expect that a retail outfit would stop reporting their same store sales data. But by the same token, could you imagine a, a world where, you know, we're a little better off because, you know, biotech that's, you know, doing some work pipetting in the lab uh, isn't, you know, distracted from, you know, curing cancer by going out and issuing uh, an update on their. Uh, on their business that is, you know, basically the same as it was last quarter. So, you know, I do think it's in the, you know, one size doesn't fit all uh, mantra, if you will. Let, let me ask a, a two-fold question. You know, Ted, I'll start with you, and then, you know, please go down. Hey, everybody, it's Jake Tapper from CNN State of the Union and FactCheck.org. This week we learned that... You know, we've had some talk about, uh, you know, Scott Stringer's, you know, uh, accountability 2.0, uh, program and he, and he's looking at uh, board diversity uh, this time around. Um, you know we you know at the chamber you know we strongly believe that you know the business you know, the business community really needs to uh, solve this issue right. We need to have more diversity within boards. In fact, uh, we uh, supported uh, Carolyn Maloney's bill of you know having the SEC bring stakeholders together to you know to try and solve the problem. But I get my my twofold question is number one with the accountability project itself, how do you see that progressing this year in terms of votes? Um, and then number two, just maybe just to delve into ESG just a little further. And I want to separate the G out for a second because you know I think governance issues are always applicable. Are we beginning to get into areas where the board is it? may or may not be the right vehicle to address some of these issues, right? Where, um, you know, I had a discussion with a group earlier this year where we had a dialogue where we were talking about these issues, and I was saying, well, it's a slippery slope, particularly when you start talking about the S and social, because that's sort of in the eye of the beholder, right? And sort of the discussion we were having, they were like, well, we sort of take things from a center-left perspective. And I said, yeah, but, you know, the New York Times had an article where they were going through some of the different social funds that are out there, and there's a there's as many different views there as there are, uh, you know, uh, people, right? So the, the question is: one is where do you see the the board project going from Stringer this year? And two, do you do you see this becoming a slippery slope for boards and companies to deal with? All right. Um... I think uh, I think companies have learned not to underestimate, you know, Scott Stringer. I think certainly from what happened with proxy access after uh, 2015, and just the widespread acceptance of the proxy access bylaws in response to his campaign. So I think uh, we certainly will see, um, you know, strong votes in, in in that area. It may take a, a year or so for it to quite get the, 
you know, get the headway and depending on how the proposals are, are, are crafted. But you know, certainly given the lessons of proxy access, I think we will see. I mean, I think from a, a company standpoint, I think it's still perf much preferable, you know, even though not everyone would agree with Scott Stringer on, on, on everything, but you know, to see it being done on a company by company basis rather than some kind of market wide mandate as you, as you see in Europe. And uh, certainly in recognition of the different uh, uh, characteristics of, 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 of public companies. But um, you know, getting to your, your, your second question about a slippery slope, it, it is, um, you know, it reminds me back of sort of the SEC's exclusion of shareholder proposals you know, that relate to various social matters you know, that use the under ordinary business. And it can be, you know, the SEC itself has grappled with this issue. What's an issue that sort of belongs in front of a board? What's ordinary business? You know, I remember seeing various proposals related to programming at the various network companies, you know, with either one proponent arguing that they were too liberal or too conservative in other cases. So yes, I, I definitely would agree that there are these issues and shareholder proposals do often sort of stray into these issues that probably shouldn't be before a board. And, um, but it's, you know, you'll have different viewpoints, you know, within the investment community and also within companies as to, you know, what issues boards should be uh, focusing on. But I think, you know, overall, most of our members would take the viewpoint that the uh, board shouldn't be, uh, you know, trying to sort of weigh in and pass social judgment on, on different issues, just given the uh, controversy and the uh, diversity of views within either a company's employees or within their customers as well. Zach? Sure, so um, I have a couple, couple points to make here. So firstly, uh, I think we largely agree with, with your point about uh, when it comes to gender diversity on boards that voluntary business-led change over time will be most sustainable and most effective. Um, that's why we, BlackRock is a signatory to the 30% Club, which is basically a group, an organization of CEOs who have signed on to uh, commit to greater gender balance in the boardroom. We think about that issue from a board performance perspective. So we, we do not take a, a social justice lens to, to the issue. Um, certainly it may be an important issue for many, but, that, but our view again is from a uh, a fiduciary and, and um, looking at economic value, so um, so we are we are engaging companies on boardroom diversity, uh, starting with gender, but but it's not limited to gender diversity. We can think about diversity in any number of ways, um, and uh, I think as as the data improves on boardroom diversity, um, investors will be better positioned to make decisions and engagement um, activities around that uh, on proxy access. We've yet to see a, uh, an actual access campaign in this market. Um, I, think, I think we take a slightly different view on access than perhaps the proponents of the proposals in that we do support proxy access as an accountability mechanism for shareholders to step in in the event of a board failure when it comes to composition and responsiveness to shareholders. But we don't view access as necessarily a mechanism that investors um, would or should be using to, to shape the composition of boards. We do think that, generally speaking, the nominations committee is best positioned to, to make those decisions. And that's why we're engaging nominations committees across, across the country on this matter. Um, and so to the extent that we're faced with a vote, we'll, we'll, we'll consider that along the lines of any other contested situation and we'll, we'll use this new responsibility um, judiciously. Um, and then finally, uh, I'm sympathetic to your points about shareholder proposals and the, and the slippery slope in that from the investor perspective, how we vote on these proposals is often misconstrued as our view on a particular issue. And that couldn't be further from the truth. It's just that we are casting these votes at specific companies um, in a manner that we think best reflects the long-term economic interests of shareholders. So it, it would seem that um, as, as there is discussion here in, in DC around 14A8,
is a Fox 10 News alert. And welcome to News Now as we are covering two dead in Buckeye Valley. <coughs> car found near the canal in Aqua Caliente and old US 80 right here and we are monitoring this developing story. Sky Fox is live in the air right now. We're continuing to follow this. Uh, obviously the Sky Fox is just getting to the scene here. Um, M CSO is investigating a car found in the canal in the far west valley and take a look at here and we're also joined by our very own Ron Hoon for this developing situation. All right, so the live pictures are coming in. It's a sad morning out there because um, just in the last few minutes, say in the last 30 minutes, uh, we did get some confirmation uh, from uh, law enforcement uh, that two bodies were found in that vehicle um, that was eventually pulled out of the canal. So this is an area, um, it's actually fairly remote from the rest of the valley. It's all the way, if you... Think about if you've ever uh, taken the I-10 mm -hmm. out to the Buckeye area, then you hop on the 85 and you go south to Gila Bend. Well, further west, that's really about the western edge of the valley. If you go further west out toward a little town that's about as tiny as they get called Arlington, uh, there is a fairly sizable uh, farming region in that little valley. And this is the canal right there that feeds the feeds the farming operations and something happened earlier this morning right in this area where you can see these are again live sky fox pictures and uh, there's the uh, there's the vehicle itself and there's the canal now what exactly led uh, the driver of that truck to somehow uh, lose control or end up in the canal we're still not quite clear but you can see there are a number of officials on scene there. You've got law enforcement, uh, you've got uh, several other uh, types of uh, uh, first responders, etc., that are on scene. Now, there's the sheriff's vehicle, and the vehicle itself that went over has already been pulled out of the mm. canal, but it's a pretty yeah. sizable canal. It really is. And uh, the confirmation of the, of apparently two people that were working there in the farming industry right uh, in that vehicle. Somehow it ended up in wow. the water a little a little while ago. There you can see the up, uh, the upside down vehicle. Look, they've got heavy equipment out there. I mean, this is there are some major farming operations right in that region, and so they were able to pull it out. And uh, you know what? I can't I can't really make out uh, any tracks or anything along those lines that might give you some sort of a clue. You know, in situations like this, it could literally be. Anything from a medical condition it's true. to if it was, uh, if in fact it went in to the drink before um, sunrise, you know, you've got a dark, uh, you got dark roads out there, just kind of a more of a difficult driving situation that might cause you to, for example, miss a curve or something along those lines. It's obviously not well lit, but something happened and whoever was driving along with the passenger uh, unfortunately both drowned. The impact of the crash must have been quite severe. These canals, we see it a lot uh, where a vehicle will go into a canal and the uh, usually it's just solo, it's just a driver who's able to get out. Uh, you know, or even if there are other people in the car, it's not that difficult. The, the canals are not that deep to simply get out of the vehicle and then swim on over to the shore and get out of there. So the impact of the collision going in there must have been fairly strong because neither uh, neither person, we don't know if they're men or women yet, neither of them were able to get out of the vehicle alive. Yeah, very unfortunate there. And uh, right now, MCSO doesn't know just how long this vehicle was in the water. Um, so mm -hmm. that's very disheartening too, is uh, uh, two lives uh, yep. taken too soon yep. there. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, it's a hard way to wake up this morning for a lot of folks uh, who no doubt work in the agricultural industry out there uh, in that part of the in that part of the state. So tough morning for them for sure. Yes, definitely. Well, we will continue to follow this story for you. I know our very own Danielle Miller is headed to the scene. That'll be her story uh, for the day. So oh, okay. uh, she is going to the scene right now. Uh, happening right now uh, in Washington, though, is on, live on the Senate floor. 
where the two Democratic senators are being sworn in right oh, now. One yeah. from Minnesota and the other from, of course, Alabama. They say that uh, there is a real political future ahead for Tina Smith. Uh, they're coming out of Minnesota. That's true. You've seen some of those no, headlines I've, as well. I've, I've heard that where we're, they yeah. think she could make a, a legitimate run at, uh, mm -hmm. at the re-election. Yeah, very popular apparently as the, um, it's a blue leaning state, Minnesota. Very popular Democrat there who replaces another well-known Democrat who had been pretty popular, but boy, he's seen his reputation take a hit. We're talking about the departure of Al Franken just yesterday from the U.S. Senate and now uh, Tina Smith. So the other big story, of course, is that Doug Jones uh, flipped Alabama from red to blue. And uh, we'll have to watch to wait and see now what Utah holds in store. Or any time you have a, I know everybody says, oh, Orrin Hatch out, Mitt Romney in. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, any time you have a powerful senator who retires, um, this, I believe the seat is more open than people might otherwise think, particularly in a year where the trend is going to be toward the Democratic Party. It's an off-year election. We always see that two years in after a big uh, sweep yep. uh, like we saw for the Republicans in 2016. So here we are. We're in 2018. What does the future hold? Well, you can see there are two new uh, and soon to be, I'm sure, prominent Democrats so in Utah, it is kind of interesting. It is more of a red state, mm -hmm. but you know, in the metro area where the mo where most of the people live, like in Salt Lake City itself, that's a very blue area. That's true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you know, we'll see what Democratic names come out of it. Uh, Mitt Romney is on the Republican side. There's the big speculation there, uh, but uh, you know, they have a very prominent Congresswoman uh, who is relatively uh, new there in her service to Utah. We might see her throw her hat in the ring. Uh, what about uh, some of the, uh, there have been Democrats that have served as governor of Utah and in other high ranking positions. So, wow, man, I'll tell you, Mike, between <laughs> well, that on. and the other races that we have to look forward to in the coming, uh, coming months, it could be a crazy year. It really could. And, uh, and talking about already a crazy year, I got to go to one of the most viral tweets so far this year from President Trump. Okay. So far, take a look at this. He, he put this out yesterday. It gained so much traction mm -hmm. as he's saying the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, just stated that the nuclear button is on his desk at all times. Will someone from his depleted and food-starved regime please inform him that I too have a nuclear button, but it is as it's much bigger and more powerful one than his, and my button works. <laughs> that, <laughs> wow. That line right at the end, my button works. I tell you, <laughs> I mean, you don't want to laugh because, uh, I mean, we're talking about nukes here, but That's on the true. other hand, um, <laughs> <laughs> just to toss that in at the end, you know, it's just a little zinger, a little zinger. Yeah, military analysts are not yet convinced at uh, the true uh, efficiency of the uh, of the nuclear weapons program combined with the missile program in North Korea. I mean, it looks more and more uh, like they know what they're doing, and it's pretty ominous. But it wasn't that long ago we had a, a one of their missiles uh, fail right at launch time. True. So, you know, anything uh, could actually be the truth there. So, yeah, I got a bigger nuke button. You know, <laughs> I, there's just so uh, the, the late night uh, host will have a, a field day with that. one. Yeah, yeah, they that, will for sure. That, and well, you know what? He wasn't done there, though, yet. Oh, he was not. That's right. He had this other one uh, that he is announcing next week. The most dishonest and corrupt media awards of the year uh, this coming Monday at five o'clock. Subjects will cover dishonesty and bad reporting in various categories from the fake news media. Stay tuned. Wow. Okay. Well, now that's what you call a platform. Yes. Right? Yes. If you have got to believe that there are other presidents and vice presidents, uh, many who have now since passed on, uh, who felt like they had an adversarial relationship with the press, who are looking at this uh, and saying to themselves, Wow, I never had that ability before because social media, you know, social media is giving traditional media a run for its money. Yeah, it really is. And so if he can go onto a platform where he has 30 million plus 
viewers. You know, and think about it, he's on every platform. He really right? is. Right, Facebook, Instagram. Instagram. He even does a little bit on Snapchat, too. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it does a little okay. on Snapchat. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's not as well updated as, of course, his Twitter, right. his, his Instagram. Yeah, but he definitely has a, wow. a big following there. Yeah. But uh, another big story that, mm -hmm. um, that we have to talk about is Steve Bannon's Ooh. explosive uh, allegations, yeah. right? So a lot of people have been looking forward to this book. Uh, it's going to be coming out soon, and you know what? You know the way it works. Uh, they, uh, you know, I think the publishers encourage you to be as uh, uh, flamboyant and as controversial as you can possibly be. And his, uh, there are two headlines coming out of uh, the the sneak peek that we're getting. One is uh, Bannon says there is quote zero chance that if that this when this meeting happened at Trump Tower with Don Jr., uh, I believe Jared Kushner was in that meeting as well, that he says there is zero chance that uh, Donald Jr. did not take the participants of, of that meeting one floor up to go meet his father. Uh, if that's true, it still, it still doesn't uh, mean, quote, collusion. Yes. I mean, it could simply be a uh, handshake and uh, nice to meet you or whatever, but it would take the uh, investigation to a whole different level because then you could actually prove uh, a full-on meeting right now it sounds like you know the narrative has been that while the president was upstairs uh, his son was downstairs looking for uh, you know potentially looking for dirt from Russian contact so that's a that is a bamboozler of a headline it really is. right there uh, can that possibly be proven if it's true We'll wait to see, but it would sure add a new twist to the investigation. At the, at the same time, he says because that meeting happened, that uh, Donald Jr. Uh, and Jared Kushner, the son-in-law of President Trump, are treasonous, that, what, that holding that meeting amounted to treason. So, a lot of headlines coming out of there. And, uh, you know, it's a new year. People are looking for new headlines to try to figure out. Okay, well, what's going to be uh, what, what's going to be the new direction? Uh, you know, because it is a new year, and I think people are either looking for a new angle, or they kind of want to move on. Uh, you know, from that story. Uh, and if you've got a bunch of new angles, then it's, it's kind of interesting to talk. About. And do you think this year in 2018 mm -hmm. will people? continue to get sick of, I mean, they got to, at one mm -hmm, point, mm -hmm. get tired of this whole Russia stuff. Well, you know, there's definitely a segment out there who's not tired of it, because look at, um, you know, there's some other networks out there besides us. Did, were you aware of this? Yeah, I yeah. just found out uh, uh, yeah. because of uh, Trump, <laughs> just to, yeah. because of the, 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 the fake news media reports. <laughs> just today, you were like going through <laughs> on the remote control, you're like, wow, there's other news networks besides us, and some of them literally can't get enough of that story sure so clearly there's an audience for it uh but it did it was starting to feel like uh it was getting kind of as we say in the business kind of moldy yep uh but if there are new angles to pursue then that makes it kind of interesting as well so who knows i mean there'll be a lot more digging into it in the in the coming days that's for sure oh Absolutely. All yeah. right. Well, one more story that we have here for you. It's a local story. This is your poll question. Oh, yeah, because good. Because we're talking about the Arizona Cardinals. Their season is over, but yep. who is going to be the QB oh my gosh. come next year? Okay, so this is what happens when I go to bed early. I don't get <laughs> I don't get up to speed on all the headlines. I came in and I said, first of all, Rich Rodriguez got fired at the U of A. You know, the football yeah. coach there, he's been subject, we learned, to an investigation over allegations of harassment. He's gone. Uh, now they've got a question about who's going to be their football coach down in Tucson. As you know, Bruce Arians, who had a stellar NFL career and really was beloved by, I think, a lot of people yeah. here in the Valley, um, really, I think, broke a lot of hearts when he announced his retirement yesterday. We're so bummed out to see uh, B.A., the beloved B.A., yeah. announce that he's hanging it up. And then la late yesterday, Carson Palmer said, I'm, I'm gone too. It's been a great career for him, but... Well, he's taken a lot of hits over the years. So my question on Twitter was a simple one. Should the Cardinals go get an exciting rookie like Baker Mayfield or Lamar Jackson? Should they pick up a veteran QB like a Jay Cutler? There were many other names that I could throw in there sure, in terms of sure. the, like a Case Keenum out of Minnesota, um, like a, a Kirk Cousins out of Washington, D.C. 
So anyway, or should they simply give it to the guy who's really earned his chance to become the new quarterback, Drew Stanton? As I have said to people who are willing to listen out here in the newsroom, uh -huh. there's a guy who has an arm on him. He, you know, but he needs, like Carson Palmer had, a chance to truly develop a chemistry yes. with Larry Fitzgerald, John Brown, and some of the other uh, Arizona Cardinal tight ends and wide receivers. So if you gave him that chance, could he be the next great quarterback for the Cardinals? Because let's face it, there's a legacy here. Kurt Warner, yep. Carson Palmer. Palmer. I mean, we're talking Hall of Famers. And so, anyway, here's my poll question. Right now, 51% love the idea of Baker Mayfield. I'm surprised at that number. That's the majority, yeah. That is big. That's he a big, big that. number. Uh, nearly 20% say Lamar Jackson because he is so exciting uh, that I, I, anytime he's playing on TV, I got to watch. Because <laughs> yeah. you just, you, Yo, can't, sure. yeah. you can't take your eyes off him. I mean, the way he moves around the field. Very explosive. Then number, or uh, uh, veteran like Cutler is 11%. That is Mike Pache's favorite yeah, option. Yeah, that's my pick to click there. Correct. <laughs> Anything with the Chicago connection, the yep. Pache man is all over it. Yes. And 19% say, hey, go ahead, give Drew Stanton a chance at it. You can come on over and vote in my poll question at Ron. Already 200 Stan. votes? I know. Already over I'm surprised. 200. You know, if you want to get up into the two or three or 400 vote range, usually you got to put a poll question up there regarding one Donald Trump. Yep. That gets people motivated <laughs> on both sides. Yes. Uh, but a lot of people are voting on this. A lot of people have strong opinions. That really is, really is. So we'll see uh, eventually what they uh, do pick, though. It's yep. going to be an interesting offseason. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, for sure. Uh, Ron, thank you so much for coming by. You bet. Top stories of the day. And when we come back, we're talking, oh, there is a deep freeze going on in the Midwest and East Coast. Oh, man. A lot of people are Ooh. complaining about that on social media. Plus snow all the way down in Florida? Yeah. Come on. It is really wild out there. We'll have more of that next on News Now. Alabama, and we welcome them. We also welcome Senator Tina Smith. For three years, she served the people of Minnesota as their lieutenant governor. Now she will join Senator Klobuchar in representing them here in the Senate. I congratulate both of these new senators. We look forward to working with them in the month ahead to make bipartisan progress and to find common ground on behalf of the American people. The Senate will need to tackle a number of important issues this year. It's my sincere hope that we can do so in a renewed spirit of comedy, collegiality, and bipartisanship. I know that colleagues on both sides of the aisle share the hope, and it's urgent that we make it a reality. Congress must reach a spending agreement by January 19th to ensure uninterrupted funding for the federal government. Among several key priorities, it is vital that our agreement provide sufficient resources for our all-volunteer armed forces. Under the Budget Control Act, America's military has been stretched thin by disproportionate cuts that have harmed our combat readiness. Since fiscal year 2013, defense cuts have outpaced, outpaced domestic spending cuts by $85 billion. I'm going to say that again, Mr. President. Since fiscal year 2013, defense cuts have outpaced domestic spending cuts by $85 billion. To fix this, we need to set aside the arbitrary notion that new defense spending be matched equally by new non-defense spending. There is no reason why funding for our national security and our service members should be limited by an arbitrary political formula that bears no relationship to actual need. So let's come together across the aisle and construct a funding agreement that gives our men and women in uniform the tools and the training they need. All right, and welcome back here to News Now as we take a live look at the Senate floor where Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is speaking live on the Senate floor just moments after two new Democratic senators were sworn in by, by the Vice President Mike Pence. Let's continue to listen in. Do more to expand the domestic economy. Iran's action in Yemen, Syria, and Iraq and its support for proxies such as Hezbollah have diverted resources away from economic reform and investment. While the government has prioritized payments to the military and security elites and clerical institutions, the people throughout Iran have suffered. Now their discontent 
is fully evident. As part of our overall strategy toward Iran, which should be focused on ending Iran's malign activities across the Middle East, we should hold accountable any officials behind a crackdown on these protests. The coming days will be noteworthy as we wait to see if hardliners use these protests as an excuse to promote even more aggressive policies toward the West and tighten their grip further on the country and its economy. Now, one final matter. <clears throat> Yesterday, a very distinguished senator announced his intention to retire at the end of this Congress. For more than 40 years, Senator Orrin Hatch has served the people of Utah in this body. He is not only our president pro tem, as we celebrated last year, Senator Hatch is also the longest serving Republican senator in the history of the United States. During this historic tenure, Senator Hatch has chaired three key committees. He's amassed deep expertise across all manner of policy issues, and he's built a truly remarkable resume of accomplishments on behalf of the American people. <coughs> Senator Hatch has defended our national security and our religious freedom. He's fought to protect Americans with disabilities and to shepherd fine judges onto our courts. And just last month, as Senate Finance Committee Chairman, he played an integral role in passing the most significant tax reform law in more than 30 years. Senator Hatch's colleagues here will be sorry to see him retire. I will miss his friendship. <clears throat> but I know his wife, Elaine, and his beloved family will be glad to welcome him home. Fortunately, it's not yet time to say farewell. The institution and the American people will benefit greatly from the senator's wisdom and famous work ethic for one more year before his retirement. <coughs> and Mr. President, I understand there's a bill at the desk due a second reading. The senator is correct. The clerk will read the title of the bill for the second time. All right there. So that was Senator Mitch McConnell there live on the Senate floor and thanking Senator Orrin Hatch. As we learned yesterday, that Senator Orrin Hatch will not seek re-election in Utah in 2018. Now we're going to go stay in Washington right here where we are getting now uh, media availability for uh, Vice President Mike Pence right now is welcoming the two Democratic senators. Let's listen in. And this is over here. This is my son Sam. Hi, I'm Emily. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would some of you like to come on this side here? Thank you. Thank you. If some of you'd like to come on this side too. Just yeah, some okay. of you family members over there. Come over this way if you want. Yeah, we will. It's our first time. Some people stay here. Very good. My mother was born in Indiana, Mr. President. And Edna Green, Indiana. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
according to Rutgers University Center for American Women in Politics. There are 17 Democrats and five Republicans who make up the women serving in the Senate. While today also marks the highest number of women serving in Congress overall, women still make up less than 20 percent of Congress. So there's that photo opportunity that Tina Smith uh, has uh, with her family and friends right now with the vice president as he was being swearing in the two senators. Doug Jones uh, was just just happened uh, from Alabama. He was accompanied by Joe Biden, the former vice president. And uh, right now we are seeing now Tina Smith, now an official member of the U.S. Senate. Speaking of the Senate, let's go back to the Senate floor where Senator Chuck Schumer speaking now. The bombing, winning their conviction, and delivering a long delayed but righteous justice. With his work, justice rolled down like a mighty stream. He'll continue to fight for civil rights and many other issues here in the Senate. I know he cares deeply about the CHIP program, which covers 150,000 young Alabamans. I hope we can get that done for his state and his country very soon. Doug Jones was an excellent candidate. Like Senator Smith, he will make an outstanding senator. She for the state of Minnesota, he for the state of Alabama. The voices of Jones and Smith will add to the diversity of energy of our caucus. I predict that both will become influential voices in this historic chamber. And each of their states had great football victories this weekend, I might add. I watched Alabama win over Clemson. Sorry, Lindsay, Tim. I watched Minnesota, my favorite team outside of the three New York teams, come in second in the whole NFC and got gain a bye as we moved to the playoffs. So it was a great day for these two states in a whole lot of ways this weekend, and it's very good so far, 2018, with the swearing in of these two senators. The first half of the 115th Congress now, let's talk a little bit about the new direction. Let the induction of these two this afternoon be the beginning of a new direction for the Senate in the second half of this Congress. The first half of the 115th Congress was not a year to be proud of. Partisan legislation emerged from the majority leader's office and was dropped on the floor of the Senate, sometimes merely hours before we were asked to vote on its final passage. Procedural gimmicks were used to avoid the Senate's long history of debate and bipartisanship. An economy racked by unfairness and inequality was made even more unfair, more unequal by the Republican majority, which almost delighted in revoking consumer protections to help big business, installed a pro-corporate Supreme Court, drove up health care premiums, and passed a tax bill dramatically skewed to the benefit of big corporations and the very wealthy. All in all, 2017 was a great year for wealthy Republican donors, but a lost year for the middle class and the working men and women of this country. We Democrats hope this year is different, focused on the middle class rather than the rich and powerful, focused on helping them in the ways we've done in the last decades, both Democratic and Republican presidents, rather than this trickle down, which benefits the few at the top and very few, the very and does not benefit the very many in the middle. These first few weeks, Mr. President, we have a chance to start off on the right foot. We have two weeks to negotiate a budget deal that also must address a host of other issues, including CHIP, community health centers, disaster aid, and of course, the Dreamers. Democrats would also like our country to make a down payment on, urging, on urgent domestic priorities, like combating the opioid epidemic, a scourge that for the first time helped cause our death rate, our life expectancy to decline because of a higher death rate from opioids. We want to improve veterans' health care. They served us. We must serve them and shore up pension plans for millions of hardworking, middle-class Americans who put money in every month and because of the stock market crash and sometimes corporate misdeeds aren't getting what they put in for. These items are crucial to the middle class, 
Take opioids, for example, 2016, a record 63,000. This is so sad. 63,000 Americans died of drug overdoses. Two-thirds or more were opioid-related. It's a full-fledged epidemic. It strikes the rich, the middle class, and the poor alike. It strikes urban America, suburban America, and rural America alike. I've had a father cry in my arms because his son had decided to turn himself around and signed up for a treatment program. But the line was so long because the funding is so scarce that the young man died of an overdose before he could enter treatment. The opioid crisis is stealing our youth. We've known about it for years, it's not new. It's heartbreaking about how much we know about it, but how little we've done about it. The American people sent us here to do the nation's business, and that means addressing its greatest challenges. So let's make a real investment in this budget deal in how we treat this scourge. That's the budget deal. The budget is the right place to start. Now, a few years ago, we made a promise to hundreds of children, hundreds of thousands of children, who were brought to the U.S. through no fault of their own, that if they registered with the government, we wouldn't deport them. We said, we want you to be Americans. Learn in our schools, work at our companies, serve in our military. 800,000 dreamers came forward and did that because above all else, they wanted to be Americans. They don't know another country. Now we're faced with a deadline. In a few months, protections for dreamers will evaporate. A thousand dreamers are losing protected status a week. It's time that Congress pass DACA protections into law and fix this once and for all. Democrats, including myself, led by our great uh, senator from Illinois, member of our leadership team, Senator Durbin, have said over and over again, we're ready to negotiate a reasonable package of border security to pass alongside DACA. We believe in border security. We want to make it work, we want to make it real, not just symbolic, but we believe in it. If our Republican colleagues and the President engage in good faith in that negotiation without unreasonable demands like an absurdly expensive, ineffective border wall that publicly many Republicans oppose and privately many more do, I don't doubt we can reach an agreement on DACA that's acceptable to both sides. And I'd like to thank our Senate pro tem, acting Senate pro tem, for his active involvement in this regard as well. In contrast to a year of chaos and ineffectiveness, a year in which little was accomplished and what was done was done for the wealthy and the narrow special interests, I hope this year can be one of bipartisanship, focused on improving the stock of the middle class. All right, that we were listening into Senator Chuck Schumer there on the Senate floor as he is addressing the 2018 legislative outlook there. You heard him talking about uh, DACA and the future of that with uh, also the border wall that uh, President Trump wants so bad. So he was uh, addressing a lot of different issues there on the Senate floor. We'll be back here with more news now in just a couple of minutes.
And welcome back here to News Now as we take a live look at the Capitol. Hi, everybody. Mike Page here. We're going to have some of the top stories for the day for you right here on News Now. And it all has to do with the North Korea tensions that continue to mount. And now President Trump, with his latest tweets, continue maybe to rile up some more, even more. Take a look at this. Well, this isn't the first time that President Trump has called out North Korea on Twitter, but these references to a nuclear button show just how serious the situation has become. Now, President Trump's button to launch a nuclear strike is really a large briefcase, the so-called football that is always nearby and carried by a military aide. But in a war of words so far, and speaking figuratively, the president shot back at North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, who bragged about a nuclear button on his desk. The president writing on Twitter, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un just stated that the nuclear button is on his desk at all times. Will someone from his depleted and food-starved regime please inform him that I, too, have a nuclear button, but it is a much bigger and more powerful one than his, and my button works. It's a tongue-in-cheek comment about a pretty serious, serious issue. Retired uh, General Jack Keane calls this a harsh reality, uh, the possibility of actual conflict as the North's volatile regime develops its nuclear and missile technologies. We're getting closer to that, to be frank about it. And the U.S. hardline stance on North Korea is now at odds with South Korea, which is hoping to open new lines of communication with its neighbor. North Korea can talk with anyone they want, but the U.S. is not going to recognize it or acknowledge it until they agree to ban the nuclear weapons that they have. But North Korea and South Korea are reestablishing these lines of communication ahead of next month's Winter Olympics being held in South Korea. In Washington, Doug Luzeter, Fox News. All right, and another story here, as uh, we were just seeing on the Senate floor, Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell talking about the 2018 legislative agenda. So what exactly will be happening in 2018 in Congress? Take a look at this report. After 40 years in the Senate, Utah's Orrin Hatch has announced he'll be retiring at the end of his term. Every good fighter knows when to hang up the gloves. And for me, that time is uh, soon approaching. Despite calls from the president for Hatch to keep fighting, after seven terms, the Republican senator says he will not be running for re-election. The president um, certainly praises his service and is very sad to see Senator Hatch leave. Now all eyes are on 2012 presidential nominee Mitt Romney, who has expressed interest in the Utah Senate seat. It's no secret Romney and President Trump disagree, and many believe Romney could become a political thorn in the side of the White House. I've met uh, Mitt Romney before. I don't know whether in Utah they'll hold it against him that he, you know, ran for, you know, was the governor of another state, you know, across the country. It's a very competitive uh, Republican state, so I Indeed. would assume there'll be uh, several people joining the fray. Effective Tuesday at midnight, Tina Smith resigning as lieutenant governor of Minnesota. Appointed by Minnesota's governor to fill the Senate seat left by now former Senator Al Franken. Smith will be sworn in Wednesday along with Alabama Senator-elect Doug Jones, who says he's ready to get to work. Health care and the CHIP program is a special thing. You know, there's all the budget issues and all that are facing us. Also on Tuesday, Republican Congressman Bill Schuster of Pennsylvania and chairman of the House Transportation Committee says he too will not seek re-election. In Washington, Lauren Blanchard, Fox News. All right, thanks so much there, Lauren. And in other news, when we're talking about the weather, well, here in Arizona, it is fine. 75 degrees expected today, but for other parts of the country, it is just downright cold as a winter blast is uh, hitting not only the Midwest, East Coast, but even Florida as well today. They were expecting temperatures to be in the 40s for a low. Another round of bone chilling cold for millions of Americans. You thought you were cold last month, but you weren't cold. <laughs> now you're cold. But it wasn't just low temperatures Tuesday. Parts of the Northeast saw Arctic blasts of snow and sleet, right as many people were back on the roads after the New Year's holiday. Outside Buffalo, New York, heavy snow and whiteout conditions caused a massive pileup on Interstate 90. Dozens of cars and tractor trailers were involved. Even more vehicles were pushed off the road into the snow. You couldn't see a gosh darn thing in front of you. Everything was blurry. There was a complete whiteout. Icy roads almost put a Dallas area police officer in the hospital. Dash cam video shows a car sliding on the slippery road, just barely missing Officer Jonathan Kramer who was responding to another accident. 
Sub-zero temperatures in Chicago Tuesday helped push the city towards its longest cold snap in decades. Chunks of ice could be seen floating down the partially frozen Chicago River. Surprisingly, Alaska is seeing unseasonably warm temperatures. The high in Anchorage Tuesday was 45 degrees, and the irony is not lost on the locals. I guess for January it's pretty unusual. Uh, usually it can be like negative 30 around this time of the year. Winter storm warnings have even been issued for parts of northern Florida, the first in nearly four years. In New York, Kelly Wright. Fox News. All right there. Th thank you so much, Kelly. And here is the very latest for your business outlook headlines. And, you know, yesterday was the first day of trading in 2018 and it got off to a great start. Here's the latest. Good morning. Tuesday marked the first trading session of 2018. Records for the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq, which closed above 7,000 for the first time ever. The Dow also inching toward 25,000. Amazon says 5 billion items were shipped through its Prime subscription service. The company says the hot sellers were its Fire TV stick, Echo Dock, and the Instant Pot. More people signed up for Amazon Prime around the world than in any other year. And a worldwide crisis could be on the way. Scientists predicting the world's chocolate supply could melt away by 2050 thanks to rising temperatures from climate change. Fortunately, candy maker Mars is pledging a billion dollars to help scientists find a way to keep the trees alive. That's business. For more, log on to foxbusiness.com. In New York, I'm Tracy Carrasco. Good morning. To And welcome back here to News Now as we take a live look at New York City. And, you know, there's a lot of people in New York that is really hoping, dreaming. Of course, well, they, they want warmer weather. Oh, yeah. They want that. That's number one. But they also, including right here in Arizona, hey, they want to get that mega millions. They want that money, honey. They want the money. They want the money. <laughs> so we're joined now by Marcy Jones, who uh, went out earlier today. Yes. And uh, got people because nobody won. No, no one won. And this actually, Mike, if you recall, I've, I've been on the Lotto Beat, you know, yeah. a few times. This ain't my first rodeo, yes. okay? And it builds, all of the excitement totally builds. It you really know. does. As the jackpot builds, so does the excitement. We're up to $418 million, mm. fourth largest jackpot in Mega Millions history. I mean, there's really not a lot you can't do with that. No, no, you could do a lot, a, a lot. lot of stuff. And you know what? So many people love doing this, even though 
Odds are extremely bad, right? What? Odds are extremely, <laughs> but you know what? No one they're, told they're, me that. They're, e they're, they're even worse if you don't play, though. Yes, right? <laughs> yes. That's what we always say. You can't win if you don't play. So like, come on, you yeah. know? And I think the whole, the, the, the mystique of the lottery yes. is for $2, you could yes. have this, you know, uh, how, however you buy it. It's not just a piece it. of paper. No. It's not just a ticket. It's it, hope. It's a ticket to maybe a new life. And a dream. Yeah, and I a love dream. This. this is so up our alley. $2 for a dream. <laughs> I know. It's just buying hope. That's all you're doing. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, a little fun because you can talk about it like, did you get a lottery ticket? I got a lottery ticket. Yeah. Oh, what, did you pick your numbers or did you get auto? You know, it's like it brings everybody together. It really does. And do you think, though, do you ever watch those shows on like TLC? I do. Like the lottery nightmares I do. of these yes. people? And it's like they thought that their entire life was made and then, you know, the picture goes into black and white and yeah. then it falls apart. Yeah. Because uh, what happens to a lot of these winners is. Yeah. They get all these phone calls and knocks on their doors I know. from like their, you know, eighth cousins. Back in the day. Yeah, they're yeah. Like, hey, uh. yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. People come out of the woodwork, yeah. want to, you know, have a piece of the pie and, you know, I saw you do this, so I'm going to go to this tabloid and say it. And it's like, what? No, yeah. Come yeah. on. So there would be a give and take. I think. Yes. Yes, definitely. You'd get the big money, but you'd probably also have some new problems. Yes. A few lottos back, we asked someone, an expert, if you mm -hmm. will what to do if you win. He said, absolutely, Run. hands down. The first, <laughs> the first thing you do, get a ticket, no. He said to get a lawyer yeah. the second that yes, you win. Yeah. And then Multiple, they handle probably. it. Lawyer, financial advisor, yeah, done. Because you, you need someone, you need help at that oh, point. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that, imagine if you're a financial advisor, right? You're at the bank, yeah. you get a call from someone that says, hey, uh, I'm the I kind of won the lottery. I'm the, that would be the best phone call for that, <laughs> I know. For that person. I know. Be like, and do you get the percentage of, don't you get a percentage? Oh, yeah, yeah. they get a little they kickback. Have to, they have to get a little mm -hmm. kickback. Maybe they throw him like a, you know, a Lamborghini or something, oh, sure. too. That managed uh, retirement fee is be pretty yeah. nice. Yeah, he'd be like, be smart with your money. But also, if you want to throw something my way, <laughs> I won't say no. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so the drawing is tonight at 8. Uh, lots of folks getting excited. You know. We always go to this one gas station because it's our favorite. Yeah. Also, the one that doesn't kick us out when we come. And it's so funny to see the way that people light up when they talk about like what they would do oh, sure. if they were free of all their financial burdens. It would open up so many possibilities. Yes. And if some is realistic, you know, pay my credit card debt, buy a house for my parents, take care of my kids' college tuition. Love that. But what I love even more is, you know, I'd buy a hot tub and fill it with Jolly Ranchers yeah. and wouldn't leave for six days. You know, it's yeah. like, that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. Yeah, that, that, yeah. That definitely that's the kind of uh, weird stuff. Yeah. I always thought, though, if I did win, mm -hmm. what I would do, you know, besides, you know, giving to family and friends, yeah, I would invite about 10 to oh 15 gosh. of my closest friends, family too, Yeah. take them all out to Vegas for a week. Oh, man. And just, and, and do like, you know, a penthouse oh, throwdown. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Where it would just be. What about be, a yacht? That's who. That's who. But we go to Vegas, then we get on the yacht. Yeah, because you know what? When you go to Vegas, you always think about, well, if if I had this much money, I could yes. have this much more fun. Yeah. You know what you'd be living life like? Nick Papa Georgia. Yeah, that's You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> For the, Vegas vacation. The Vegas vacation connection. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's That movie was great because his poor father could not win a dime. While, I know. Well, uh, Nick Papa Georgio. He goes, I put a dollar and I got a car. I put a dollar and I got a car. <laughs> I mean, he just keeps winning. It's so funny. Yeah. Oh. I love it. Yeah, you gotta love it. All right, so let's, let's show the video of, yes. uh, of you. Yeah, this is what happens when I run up to people and I don't ask them for permission to talk to them. Okay, yeah. so, th so this was. Uh, <laughs> oh, it was an ambush. An ambush. Yeah. All right, this ambush is. Ambush Mega Millions. All right, thanks so much for coming on. <laughs> Troy, if you get that, you're gonna have more bones than you could dig up in a graveyard. I'm here with Carolyn, and I love Carolyn because I always try to harass people and they always say no, 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 no. But you came up to me and you said, can I be on TV? Yeah. I'm obsessed with you. My name is Carolyn Serlin, and if I won the jackpot, yeah. I would pay off my credit card debt and retire from work. <gasps> That's amazing. Good plan, Carolyn. Well, good luck tonight, Hi. okay? Hi. So proud of you. I feel like you're a winner. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go outside because I feel like everyone else in here doesn't. Do you wanna be on TV? No, I'm okay. What? Oh, you're okay? Oh, you're kind of cute. Hi. Okay, so we're going outside. Hang on. Good morning. I feel like you're a winner, sir. Okay, we're going to go see if we can. This way, I feel like people are gassing up. They can't say no to me. So let's, let's see how we can. Hi there. Hi. We're doing a store in the lottery. It's $418 million. What would you do if you won that money? Oh, I have no idea. What? Come on! <laughs> and you're wearing fur, you're fancy. Would you get some fun thing? Uh, yeah, get a new house, a new Ooh. car, go Ooh. on vacation. I love that. I love your eyes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's green. Okay. 
Oh, we're gonna go over here. Hang on. Okay. Hey, girl. Hi. We're on. Okay. So we're doing a story about the lottery. It's four hundred eighteen million dollars. If you win tonight, what would you do if you won that? Oh, I haven't even bought a ticket, but girlfriend. Oh, uh, maybe I need to. <laughs> what? Where's the other half of your shirt? I cut it oh, off this morning. <laughs> well, if you win, you can buy a whole shirt. I know, right? Woo! So proud of you. Okay, guys. Well, this is happening tonight. The drawing is at eight. Four hundred eighteen million dollars. It's the fourth largest jackpot in history. We're all very excited about it. What happened oh, to your guys shirt? Behind me. I can't believe you said that. That was the funniest bit. Oh, there's the cute guy. Oh, go introduce yourself, Yeah, go, go Marcy. say hi, Mars. Yeah. See, what's his name? Cute guy. Should we? Wait, sir. <laughs> this could be my only chance at love. Hang on. I don't see a wedding ring either, Marcy. Oh, he's Are you running. married? No, I don't see oh, a wedding ring. Oh, he's he's hiding. Oh my God, he's literally hiding from me. Jason. Are you married? No. Oh, he's not married. Ooh, oh, he's so single. So, are, are you looking for love? Uh, not currently, no. Not, not currently. Okay, me either. All right, that's cool. It's fine. It's fine. All right. We're just gonna be friends. It's better that way. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll probably buy a ticket. Yeah. I have a better chance at that than finding a boyfriend. Than finding a boyfriend at the gas station. Oh my God, you guys, we're having too much fun out here. The best. You might want to date me if I win. <laughs> All right, and thank you, to Marcy. As uh, it's just so early in 2018, but we're already going to say that that was the best live shot for AZAM, hands down. There, take a look there. So no big winner yet for the Mega Millions jackpot, creeping up there, almost 420 million dollars. What would happen if you won? That is the question so many people want to know. What would they do? We'll see if there's any big winners from Arizona. Now taking you back out live on the Senate floor. In the obvious boundaries of what is appropriate in language, pornography, et cetera, that you have a right to get the content that you want and to get that content unimpeded on these tablets that we carry around in our pockets. Now, Mr. President, that right to get this content is threatened. And it's threatened because the federal communications on a partisan vote of three to two have completely overturned the previous rules that had been set on a partisan vote the other way of three to two. At the end of the day, what it means is that those of us in this chamber led off first by the Commerce Committee, are going to need to have a legislative solution. But in the meantime, chaos is thrown upon the system. Now, as a result of the previous year's rules being completely reversed, they're gonna be all tangled up in federal court and we're going to go on and on and have this fight. But what I want to call to the attention of the Senate today is in the process of the new rulemaking that resulted in this three to two vote that's upended everything. The process itself was flawed. Now, mind you, we come in to this on net neutrality. The public has no ambiguity on this. As reported by the Wall Street Journal, as reported by MSNBC and Mr. President, I would ask that two articles related to the same be admitted, I ask unanimous consent into the record. Without objection. And in those articles, it points out that net neutrality is widely popular. 83% of the American public support net neutrality. The other 17%, some of them say they don't. I don't know how they don't, but it's a pretty overwhelming majority, 83%. But even among Republicans in the surveys that have been done, 76% of self-identified Republicans 
say that they support net neutrality. Here's the flaw in the process that the FCC used. 24 million comments came in from supposedly Americans, and I put quotations around that, that were filed either for or against the rulemaking. There's a problem in this record that was built because two million of those comments featured stolen identities. It was not a real person. It was somebody else's identity. Some of those identities were people that had long since died. Half a million comments were from Russian addresses. 50,000 consumer complaints were inexplicably missing from the record. Now let's take the part from Russian addresses. Uh, isn't this beginning to tell us something that we know that there was Russian interference in the last election? We also know by our intelligence community that there was Russian entrance into the voting records of some 20 states. Now we're seeing the Russian influence enter in to the making of law, in this case, the rulemaking, trying to influence comments, whether it were comments for the rulemaking or against the rulemaking, it's another indication that Russia indeed is intending on distorting eliminate the net neutrality rules, which the Republican chairman and the FCC majority promptly ignored. And the FCC is refusing to even work with law enforcement to get to the bottom of this issue. Shouldn't the fact that there are Russian bots and people directed by the Kremlin trying to influence our government processes, shouldn't that be something that we ought to be working with law enforcement? Well, Mr. President, I'm going to continue to raise this issue. And welcome back here to the news. And now there was just a massive apartment fire in Georgia this morning where 12 people had to be rescued, including eight kids taken to a hospital. More than 45 fi firefighters battled this apartment fire shortly before dawn in Atlanta that injured about a dozen people.
The injuries, though, were minor and mostly re related to smoke inhalation. So that's the good news there. But when you take a look there, an apartment fire this massive, definitely it could have been much worse. Now, listen to one of the firefighters there that was battling the fire. Take a listen to this. As we got here, we were actually affecting rescues. Um, I've just been informed that our firefighters, it was literally all hands on deck. Before we had even put a hose line on the fire, we had firefighters that were bringing adults out. We have firefighters that were catching babies one after another because there are eight out of the 12 injuries were children and the other four were adults. Uh, we even had one of our shift commanders to actually bring out an individual in the wheelchair as the fire was happening. So that just shows you the bravery uh, and the, uh, the expeditiousness of our firefighters putting life safety first before they even put any water on the fire. Right now, the, all the victims, the four adults and the eight children are at the hospital. They are doing fine. The primary thing that we were concerned with was the exposure to the smoke. We didn't want to take any chances, especially due to the fact that there are some babies in there. So we wanted to make sure that we got them in an environment that was away from the fire where we could further evaluate them and make sure that they were in good condition. I just got a report that they are, so we're happy about that. What age and how young? How young are these kids? Uh, they go down to one month. One month is, is the youngest. Uh, I believe the oldest was approximately 36. The adults, uh, there were a couple of adults that had some minor burns. So everyone got transported. Right now, we've notified MARTA to bring some buses here so, so that some of these folks that are displaced can sit down in a warm environment. We've got Red Cross on the way to help with this, and we also have spoken with Apartment Complex Management, who's opening up their offices so that people can go into another warm environment. So we're trying to get the people situated as we're fighting this fire. Talk about the, you said they were catching them? I mean, like okay, Susan, I heard you. Second and third story going over the balcony, or tell me about that. I mean, we were catching babies like the football, literally. I mean, they were, there were adults that were on the balcony that were dropping their babies right into our arms. We had several, a, a couple of firefighters catching babies. So it was just really incredible. Um, this, these were eyewitness accounts by our own firefighters that are in rehab now that have shared this with me in addition to our chief. So we've had a lot going on this morning uh, here at the Pine Tree Apartments. All right there. So that was great news there. It could have been much worse there. And uh, you heard it from that firefighter where uh, they were catching those babies like footballs, he said there. So uh, definitely a sound bite that is going to be replayed there in Georgia today, no doubt. So uh, thankfully, uh, those people there are looks like they're all going to be OK. Just uh, getting some treatment there at local hospitals. Well, we continue the biggest uh, news and now story of the day, and it's all about that winter cold that we are dealing with here. Uh, not here in Arizona, luckily, but uh, across the country, people are having deep freeze. I have to show this, though, because this really just shows the comparison right now. On the left is our downtown Phoenix shot. On the right, South Dakota, and a deep freeze going on there. This is actually a waterfall that was frozen over right now. So uh, definitely a lot of people going through some big changes there in South Dakota, no doubt. Uh, and then we're just getting the speed in as well of uh, some snow coming down uh, in the southeast. Take a look at that there. So uh, wild winter weather happening right now all over the country. And uh, more news now will continue next.
And welcome back here to News Now. We are taking a live look from our very own Ty Brennan, who right now is doing a uh, Facebook Live right now in Marana, as uh, we are going to be shortly seeing the final Delta 747 flight land in just a couple of minutes. It's, it's expected at about 11.06 here, so uh, coming up very shortly, it is the farewell flight and uh, our very own Ty Brennan is covering that story today as Delta is retiring the Boeing 747 workout workhorse with the farewell U.S. flight. After nearly 50 years, the aircraft is being retired in the United States for good. The commercial airliner, which was once hailed as the queen of the skies, has been embraced by every major U.S. carrier since the first model rolled off the line back in 1968. At one point in 1990, there were 130 of the jets in operation throughout the country, but many airlines gradually retired their fleet with cheaper, more efficient models, including Airbuses, or, or newer Boeings in more recent years. And today, the Delta Airlines is flying the last of the country's 747s from its hub in Atlanta to the airport graveyard in Marana, Arizona. This particular plane, a 747-400 model operating as Delta Airlines 9771 will reportedly be piloted by the Delta Captain Paul Gallagher Peru. Uh, by a report by the Point Sky, aviation editor John confirmed on Twitter that the passengers will include a mix of Delta employees and reporters. The flight doesn't come without its share of bittersweet fanfare, of course. In anticipation of its final Boeing retirement, Delta's last Boeing aircraft embarked on a farewell tour in December that made stops in Atlanta, Minneapolis, and Los Angeles following a trip to the Boeing factory in Everett, Washington, allowing fans and admirers one last voyage. And it's saying goodbye to an old trusted friend, said the pilot and Bo Bo Boeing enthusiast Robin Boone, saying one of the aircraft's farewell flights in December. It's so sad to see it go, but it was an incredibly wonderful career, and this airplane was the highlight. So once again, folks, if you are just joining us here, welcome to the Fox 10 News Now stream. We are taking a live uh, Facebook Live from our very own Ty Brennan, who is covering this story today of uh, the final Delta 747 flight that is landing here in Arizona. It's expected any moment right now, so we are continuing to take a look at the skies here and see when this uh, Boeing 747 will land uh, just very shortly. It's been an incredible, incredible time for this plane. After 50 years, the aircraft is finally going to be retired here. So uh, definitely something to uh, see and watch. And uh, we're going to continue to watch this. Let's listen in if we could. Uh, is nothing new for the president. We will All right, very cool here as we continue to wait. We just uh, moments away from this moment coming here right here and it looks like uh, Ty Brennan is able to capture this right here on Facebook Live for us. Let's listen in. And look at this, it, it took off again. It was a flyby, it was a uh, 747 touch and go as they call them. Now, now do you think that was on purpose or did he want to maybe a couple more <clears throat> uh, yeah, photo shots? Yeah, maybe they're trying to give, yeah, a couple. Hey look, if it's the last flight, you gotta milk it <laughs> yes. a little bit. 
at the end. Yeah, Why so not? Right now, uh, joined by our very own Troy Hayden as we are looking at this Facebook Live by Ty Brennan, who's out there uh, at the airport. Yeah, yeah, so it was a little bit of a flyby we just saw there. Yeah, end of an era. I mean, uh, growing up, uh, there was nothing cooler than seeing those 747s fly in. Of course, Air Force One, mm -hmm. is a, you know, there's two Air Force uh, One, the, the two planes, they're both modified 747s, and they're gorgeous. It's a huge aircraft when you get up next to it. You know, it towers up there like a, almost like a high rise. You sure, know? sure. And uh, it's a, a big plane. I remember back uh, in the 70s uh, when I used to fly uh, as a kid, you get on a 747, they used to have the spiral staircase mm. in the middle of the main cabin when you walked in the first class. And you went up there to the very top. It's like a double decker. And the very uh -huh. top was a lounge. Wow. You could go up there and there's like a bar up there for all the first class passengers <laughs> yeah. to go up there and mingle. And smoke. <laughs> yes, yeah, you know? yeah. Back when you could smoke. Oh, yeah. And in, the, in the 70s, that was the day. But yeah, a real workhorse. But, you know, over the course of time, these jumbo jets, and then you think about how old the technology is. We're talking about probably, what, 50 year old technology yep. almost? Yeah. So everything gets more efficient. They're using more composites, mm -hmm. they're using uh, more efficient engines. And, and when you talk about, you know, uh, fuel costs and operating costs and maintenance costs are going to, to newer airlines. So. And it has to be such a bittersweet moment for the crew and, uh, and the people working on these planes too, right? Yeah, I mean, th think about if you've got uh, a flight attendant or a pilot, you know, who's, who's been working since, you know, they were the premier aircraft to sure. be in. And so now they're getting phased out, you know. And I, you know, you, you d didn't see as many 747s. There was a 747 that had a pretty regular flight out of Phoenix for a while. It was the... Um, What's the one that goes to London? Uh, British Air. Mm. It was a British Airways 747. Yep. And, and uh, you know, when I would come into work in the afternoons, I would often see it landing. Oh, and, you okay. know, you, you can't miss a 747 sure. when you see yes. it in the air because it is a big plane. It's not a 737 you always see, you know, Southwest flying and things like that. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of sad, but at the same time, it's progress. You know, you've got a very old plane up there, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes to design technology and things. And, you know, they're updating their fleets and they're making flying more efficient for all of us and keeping the cost down, hopefully. Yeah, the, the, hopefully that's what a lot of people want to consider too. Yeah, so uh, I, they did the little flyover now. You think it's, it's a time big. to approach again? Yeah, I mean, this isn't an F-15. It's <laughs> yeah. not going to circle around so fast. It takes <laughs> yeah. a little while. But this this Marana area is such a an interesting area in itself too. And you, know, I've, you sit there and you look at these massive planes that are sitting out there and they're a, I think they're a bunch of 747s. I don't know, it's a bunch of jumbo jets out there. And you always think, well, they had to get here by flying, mm -hmm. uh, so they're still workable, <laughs> yes. you know, yet they just parked them there. That's true, yeah. And, uh, and you wonder, I always wonder, well, what are they, what are they doing there? What, I mean, do they take them and use them for parts? Yeah. I can't imagine that's good. No, no. You don't want to, yeah. you know, yeah. let's pull the wing off that plane yeah, that's been sitting yeah, in yeah. Miranda for the last 20 years yes. and put it on this one. Uh, but that's what's where these planes are. And, you know, with all the aluminum and all the, I'm sure there's a lot of metal in there that they could scrap and, and recycle. But, yeah, I mean, there's got to be I, I don't know if it's hundreds but it's definitely dozens of big jets out there just parked oh, in the yeah. desert yeah yeah definitely yeah, yeah that's definitely one thing you don't want to hear is uh, if you need a new part for a plane and <laughs> hey, grab an engine off, grab an engine <laughs> off that plane in Marana I think oh. that still flew but it's weird though isn't it? I mean when you when you uh, scrap a car after using it all those years you know a lot of times they just go and get crushed or they get totaled out or something like that yeah. but you know you wouldn't just take a car and just go park it in a parking no, lot no, somewhere no you wouldn't yeah, so uh, here it comes, are, I think. Yep. I think I see a dot on the horizon. Ty's doing a pretty good job holding this together. Oh, yeah, see? Yep, yep. Yeah, oh, look there at that. Go, Ty. There you go. Thanks, Ty. So he's helping us. Uh, I don't think with Facebook Live, can you Zoom? I don't think you can on Facebook Live, right? It'll you're, be, it'll be big just, soon enough. Yeah. It'll be big soon enough. Yep. So for those of you uh, just joining us here, welcome to News Now as we're taking a look at this final Delta 747 flight landing uh, very shortly here in Arizona. I'm sorry, I just kind of got thrown up here uh, a second ago. So is this the last 747 flown by a domestic car yes, carrier? Yes, for Delta. For Delta. Del for Delta. Okay, so we still have 747s in the air with other domestic yes. carriers. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Delta's got a decent sized hub here. You know, our, our biggest hubs, of course, are uh, Southwest and American here in Phoenix. But, um, yeah, end of an era for, uh, for Delta. They fly all over the place, these big planes. And now they've got, you know, DC-10s that are still in use. Those are that's some older technology as well. And you think about a half a century for this plane. I mean, that is a workhorse. Right? So, yeah, 1970 was 50 years ago. More than that, 57 years ago, yep. right? No, 47 years ago, almost 50 years ago. 
Uh, work on my mask. Here it comes. You can see it now. It's getting closer. Now you think this might be another flyover? Or do you think no, this might be the real deal? No, I think he's going to go. I think he's going to drop it here. Yeah, he's got he's got the landing gear down. And there it is. End of an era for Delta Airlines. Yeah, and you can see the the second level there above. Wow. Just listening to it, you just hear that power. It's not even. Oh, yeah. Those are, those are big engines. I still marvel sometimes at the technology, you know, that basically the wing technology that the Wright brothers, you know, copied from a bird. <laughs> yeah. Basically making wind go faster over the top of the wing yes. from the bottom and creating lift. That's true. And that gets all that weight up in the air. I know. Air. It's, it's really unbelievable. Well, it looks like maybe it's... I'm glad it froze there. Yeah, that's... Uh, Ty, could you solid. Imagine? Thank you, Ty. <laughs> wow, that could have been much... Could you imagine we were talking about it for the next 10 minutes? <laughs> And uh, it's, that, it's, it's a little dot off in the <laughs> yeah. distance. We're like, we, we, uh, we, can, we can tell you it landed. That, that would have been bad, though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. So, Marana, you know, probably about an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes south of Metro Phoenix. Uh, just a big area out in the desert. It's just north of Tucson. Yes. And they park big mothballed jets out there. And now uh, the last Delta 747 one. for Delta sitting out there. That'll be interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to his uh, reporting there today because it'll be probably talk to the pilot, probably talk to the crew members. I don't think so. That'll yeah, be look, on a flight like this, I, I would almost bet, and again, I'm sorry, I just got sat down here, so I should have this info, but I bet that he, uh, I bet there's some special people on that plane. Oh, sure. Wouldn't you think? Oh, yes. Now, do you think there's or somebody? even uh, like Delta CEO? Or I like, don't know about that, but wouldn't you think that yes. for the final flight they'd do something like that? Oh, yeah. I don't know. So, yeah, Ty, Ty's great, and he knows his stuff when it comes to planes, too. Yes. I think he comes from an air family yeah yeah he loves the because he said on, on today on Facebook that he hit the uh, news lottery today uh, by getting the story yeah, he did I'm like uh, I'd still want to win the mega millions though <laughs> <I'd still laughs> yeah. win. the news lottery not quite as great as the lottery yes, lottery but, but yeah at least a good you day have work a story that you're comfortable with though no doubt you got it all good right. talking with you buddy yeah you too that Thanks was fun so to much, watch Troy. see you guys all right we're taking an now a live look here at the White House where oh about an hour from now or hour and a half we are expecting a White House press briefing that'll happen Sarah Huckabee Sanders going to have a lot to talk about today um, we did see President Trump's tweets from earlier and uh, well, he had a lot to talk about including let's take a look at it here uh, he, tweeting out about the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un just stated that the nuclear button is on his desk and at all times will someone from his depleted and food starved regime Please inform him that I, too, have a nuclear button, but it is much bigger and more powerful one than his, and my button works. But he didn't stop there. He also had an announcement that the most dishonest and corrupt media awards of the year will be issued on Monday at 5 o'clock. Subjects will cover dishonesty and bad reporting in various categories from the fake news media. Stay tuned. Still, we don't know if this is going to be something that is going to be done on camera or if it's just going to be tweets about uh, the awards that will be given out. So uh, stay tuned. You know, you, you, you never know what's going to ha come next from uh, President Trump, no doubt. Well, here's something, uh, another story that we got to bring to you. And you never really see this too often in Florida of uh, the... <laughs> Look at this radar here as they were getting um, some freezing rain, especially in the northern counties there in Florida uh, today. And uh, they were definitely de dealing with some close to freezing temperatures. And this is an interesting story. A Fox 32 reporter in Chicago where they're dealing with very cold temperatures did a live talk back with the Fox Orlando station. And take a look at this as uh, they were talking about the weather. 
has been cold here in Chicago for quite some time. I mean, really, yesterday well below zero, okay? And today, we're calling it a warm-up because we're expecting for most of Chicago land area to reach about 16 degrees. Believe it or not, that is about 30 degrees warmer than we've seen, okay? So that should put it all into perspective for you. I want to show you something. We're about 21 miles outside of Chicago right now. We're actually in the area called Western Springs, and there is a little bit of snow coming down right now. We're actually at a commuter rail station. I want you to look at these tracks because one thing you probably have never heard of before, they call it like a heating switch that they install on the track. So just in case snow or ice were to accumulate on those tracks, they're able to warm them up so those trains can move throughout our city pretty easily. So I think that's really interesting. One other thing I want to show you because I heard you say a little bit earlier, I was listening in onto your newscast, you said that those space heaters were selling out. And I, I had to laugh only because you're talking about the upper 40s. I know that's cold for you guys, but here, if we were in Chicago, people would be wearing shorts. I'm going to strip down just a little bit. Okay, it's not going to get, you know, this isn't lewd, but I want to show you just, you know, how cold it is here and what we have to deal with because I don't think people sometimes really understand. Okay, this is my old uh, Fox 40 sweatshirt from when I worked at Fox 40 in Sacramento, but the layers are thick. That's a t shirt, okay? This is like your little snow pants. Most people use these when they go skiing. And then under there, I have a, a whole nother layer of sweatpants and then under there, another layer. I can't show you all, but I have about uh, three pairs of socks on. So when you talk about cold weather, I'm sorry, Florida. I can't really feel too sorry for you guys. I, I just can't. I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right there. Uh, thank you uh, so much to the reporter there in Chicago who's really uh, giving uh, the Florida stations there some hard time as uh, they're talking about 40 degrees. They can't handle that right now. All right. Taking you now back out to the uh, Senate floor where we do have another senator speaking live right here on News Now. And the people did not come. The tourists did not come. Now, I haven't even spoken about the economic and environmental degradation that occurred throughout the entire Gulf and the fishing industries. And of course, the administration has proposed to do now drilling off the east coast of the United States, including off of the coast of the state of the presiding officer. Uh, there are a number of us that have come together that don't think that that matches with what our tourism industry is. Certainly doesn't match with regard to our uh, fishing industries. But it also does not match with our United States Department of Defense training and testing mission. So if you look at the Gulf Coast off of Florida, the only place where it is off limits in law, that's the largest testing and training area for the United States military in the world. But if you go up and down the Atlantic coast of the eastern seaboard, you will see training range after training range. And you get as far south as the central east coast of Florida, and lo and behold, what is that area of protection for not only the U.S. Department of Defense, but for NASA and other agencies? It's because that's where we are rocketing our satellites into orbit, of which the first stages have to have a place to land. That's where when we had the space shuttle and soon we are rocketing astronauts, American astronauts to the International Space Station on American rockets, many of whom first stages will fall in the Atlantic Ocean below, just like the solid rocket boosters did on the space shuttle when it launched. And so there are reasons not to have drilling platforms out there. But let's come back to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. What happened was deep below the seabed, miles further into the Earth's crust, 
pressure had built up and an explosion had occurred. The safety mechanism is right where the pipe comes out of the seabed and that pipe then goes up five miles to the surface to deliver oil. The safety mechanism is a blowout preventer which is like a huge set of pincers that comes through and cuts off the pipe. If that blowout preventer, in other words, preventing the blowout of the well, if it is defective like it was in the BP oil spill, five million barrels of oil spewed out five miles below the surface of the Gulf into the waters of the Gulf of Mexico and rendered the havoc and economic damage that it did. So in the turmoil and trauma that ensued, there was obviously a need in the Department of Interior, in the Bureau of Safety, it's called BSEE, to go in and change the rules to give additional safety mechanisms to make sure that this wouldn't happen again. Well, lo and behold, there is now a change and we are starting to see the first attempts at the weakening of those rules. Sometimes the issue of regulatory reform feels abstract or arbitrary. This is technical stuff, it's dry. But safety standards created after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill they're not dull and boring. They're life or death. They were written specifically to make sure that families like those 11 that lost their loved ones wouldn't have to be notified again that there was a preventable death. So what are these new rules about? Well, they're coming in on the blowout preventer, which is a system to control the flow of oil to seal an oil well. They, a blowout preventer is what stands between the enormous pressure that builds up in the oil well pipe and the ocean around it. Its purpose is exactly what the name sounds like. It's to prevent the oil from blowing out into the sea uncontrollably. And how many days did it take? It took several months to finally get that well capped 5,000 feet below the surface of the water. These are massive pieces of equipment. The blowout preventer for Deepwater Horizon stood 57 feet tall, and it weighed over 400 tons. That's how big this thing is. And then there is a piece of that blowout preventer, 57 feet high mechanism, a, a device called a shear ram, a device with two blades that seal off the well in an emergency. And that's what failed to fully close in the BP oil spill. Now what the Interior Department in this administration is trying to do is undo the updated standards for shear rams and blowout preventers and is trying to get rid of a required third party to certify the safety mechanisms.
And welcome back here to News Now as we do take a live look at the White House where we are expecting within the next 90 minutes a White House press briefing. We'll have that for you on Fox10Phoenix.com. Hi everybody, Mike Pace here continuing to take feeds from all over the country. And remember when breaking news does occur, we've got you covered right here. Well, it is a big winter storm watch, not only for Midwest and the East Coast, but also the North Carolina coastal areas as well. And uh, officials there are bracing for the very worst. Take a look. Generally, around noon to early afternoon, it will be turning to snow. And by late of the afternoon, it will be mostly snow. The I-95 corridor and points east are expected to see two to eight inches of snow and a quarter inch of ice. And the northeastern counties stretching from Greenville to Elizabeth City are expected to see six to eight inches of snow. Counties in the central part of the coast could see as much as a quarter inch of ice accumulating along with very strong winds, uh, which is an important part of this. Uh, the expected snow amount uh, could have high winds, and as a result, there is bl a blizzard warning for the northeastern counties of Camden and Currituck. And between the high winds and the possibilities of some ice and the very cold temperatures, we expect that travel will be difficult and dangerous with power outages that are possible. The good news is that the storm is moving quickly and should be gone by Thursday evening. The bad news is that we will have unusually cold temperatures sticking around for several days. And those frigid temperatures can be dangerous, particularly for people who may lose power during the storm. Uh, and also these colder temperatures will make it harder for first responders and transportation crews. I want to tell you a little bit about what we are doing. Our state and local emergency managers are in close contact and have already been coordinating for several days. This morning, we activated our State Emergency Operations Center, our key state emergency response team partners, such as the Department of Transportation, the Highway Patrol, the National Guard, emergency management, and the utilities. And that allows us to deploy essential assets for storm response and any recovery that is needed. Our state troopers are marking abandoned vehicles along the roadway. The highway patrol is coordinating with law enforcement officers across the state and other emergency responders to check and mark all abandoned vehicles to ensure that no one is left stranded in these dangerous conditions. We're following the state's quick clearance policy, which instructs DOT crews to swiftly clear the road by pushing any vehicle that may impede traffic out of the roadway and onto the shoulder. Given the storm's timing, several school systems are adjusting their schedules. 28 school systems, all in the eastern or central part of the state, are releasing students early today and six school systems are closed today. Several systems in the West had a delayed start. The adverse weather policy is in effect for state employees. Mandatory state employees must continue to report to work because they perform essential job functions. The non-mandatory state employees should use their discretion and keep yourself safe and talk to your managers and supervisors. All state employees should keep in touch with their supervisors and use their caution and good judgment. The State Highway Patrol is shifting resources today to cover potential trouble spots given the forecast. Our North Carolina National Guard partners are also actively engaged and ready to respond as needed. Uh, we're also expecting bitter temperatures and with the cold and the potential powder out power outages, that is a dangerous combination. So we're asking people to stay off the roads, 
tonight and tomorrow because travel can become dangerous. And remember that unnecessary travel not only puts you at risk, but also can potentially put emergency responders and law enforcement at risk who have to respond to help you. Also, the more vehicles that we have on the road, the tougher it is for the DOT crews to treat and clear those roadways and get them back open again. So if you absolutely must travel, clear your vehicle before you drive. And if you have to be on the road, slow down and leave room between you and other vehicles. To, pair, to prepare for the extreme cold, make sure you wear multiple layers of clothing, cover any exposed skin when you're outside, and limit your time outdoors. <clears throat> and if you must use an alternate heating source in your, your home, make sure that you know how to do it safely. Never run generators or use grills indoors. For those with mobile phones, I encourage you to download the Ready NC app, which can give you the real-time road conditions and emergency preparedness information. I want to call on Jim Trogdon, the Secretary of Transportation, to talk a little bit about what his crews are doing on the roadways in eastern North Carolina to try to make them safe. And I, just to make sure you all know who everybody is, we've got Eric Hooks, who is the Secretary of the Department of Public Spray, uh, Department of Public Safety, Mike Sprayberry, who is head of emergency management, who's with us, uh, Jim Trogdon, Secretary of Transportation, Glenn McNeil, who's the Colonel, Commander of the Highway Patrol, and General Luck, who. All right, it looks like we're having just a little problems uh, with that video there, but I do want to take you just uh, out to Savannah, Georgia right now. We're just getting this live feed in and you can see it is snowing right now in beautiful Savannah, Georgia here. What a way to start 2018. And as I say that, they take the shot away from us. So uh, we'll continue to uh, monitor that out of Savannah, Georgia. Looks like we got another shot out of the Savannah there, though. They keep uh, changing it up on us here, though. Welcome to News Now, everybody. As uh, the South and the Southeast really dealing with uh, some winter weather, major winter weather advisories in Georgia, Florida, and the coastal areas of North Carolina. You're watching here News Now, part of Fox10Phoenix.com as this winter storm watch continues for eastern coastal North Carolina. We'll be back here with more News Now coming up next. I use the same kind of critter, a little fish. It's about that big. The ones, their progeny were stunted. They were mentally deformed, could not act like normal killifish is the name. It's a little fish about that big. Compared to the bays and the bayous where those killifish hatched and grew in waters without oil sloshing around in those waters. And so for 87 days, 
five million barrels of oil gushed. And I bet that folks don't even realize that there's a spill that's happening right now. Matter of fact, it's been leaking for 13 years. In 2004, Hurricane Ivan toppled an offshore drilling platform owned by Taylor Energy, and because of the way that the platform slid, several of the wells were buried and have yet to be plugged. We all know it's not a question of if there'll be another spill, but when. And oh, by the way, the one that's been going on since 2004. And how catastrophic is the next one? Is it going to be off of the Carolinas? Is it going to be off of Virginia and all of our military fleet in Norfolk? Is it going to be off of Jacksonville and Mayport, as well as the sub-base for our Trident submarines? Is it going to be off of Canaveral, where our commercial government rockets are launched into space, dropping first stages, and where the testing for the Trident submarine that is based in Georgia where that testing is done with the telemetry on the Eastern Air Force Eastern Test Range. That's why more than 41,000 businesses on the Atlantic coast have expressed opposition to drilling in the Atlantic Ocean. And that's why NASA doesn't want drilling anywhere near the Kennedy Space Center. And that's why the Department of Defense has said time and time again that we should protect and extend the moratorium on drilling in the Eastern Gulf. Bipartisan Senator Mel Martinez, a Republican from Florida, and I in 2006 passed a moratorium for the Eastern Gulf of Mexico off of Florida because of the military as well as all of the environmental things that I've talked about. The Air Force just at the end of last year came to us, wants to put $60 million of new improvements for exquisite telemetry as we are testing some of our most sophisticated weapons systems in the Gulf testing range. That's the Gulf of Mexico off of Florida. But they don't want to make that investment of $60 million to upgrade all of the telemetry unless they have the assurance that it's going to be off limits to oil drilling, not just until 2022, which is in the law, but they want it extended another five years until 2027. And yet, we cannot get it up. This senator tried to get it into the defense bill, an appropriate place that the senator who is the presiding officer serves on that distinguished committee led by John McCain, the Armed Services Committee. We couldn't get it up because of oil interest not wanting to give the airport, the Air Force, the security that their $60 million investment on advanced telemetry would be protected for not five years from now, but 10 years from now. The only reason the administration wants to spend time writing a new one is because the oil industry wants them to open up a whole lot more acreage to drilling, not just in the Gulf. They want the entire outer continental shelf of the United States on the West Coast and from New Jersey south as you come down the state, including the ones that I've already mentioned in the southeastern United States, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. I don't think that we 
should expose even one acre of federal waters to drilling until we've got strong safety standards in place to protect another spill, to protect the workers that lost their lives from ever happening again, to protect the environment, to protect the coastal economies that are so dependent on the beautiful beaches and to protect the national security interest in our testing and training ranges. It took six years to finalize these rules, and now in a matter of 30 days, comments are out there to undo these rules. That shouldn't happen. So will other voices in the Senate speak up? It's happening right underneath our noses. Mr. President, I yield the floor. All right, that was Senator Bill Nelson, a Democrat from Florida on the oil drilling on the U.S. coastlines there. And uh, he was talking on the Senate floor for about more than 20 minutes on oil drilling in the U.S. Hi everybody, Mike Pace here as we continue on with the news now. We're now we're going to take you from Washington to New York, where the New York governor, Andrew Cuomo, is doing a state of the state right now. Let's listen in. Practical politics, actual politics that makes a difference in their lives because they're suffering today and they need life to be made better for them. And that that, my friends, is what we have done. Marriage equality, paid family leave, $15 minimum wage, Excelsior College tuition, gun safety, climate coalition, MWBE. No other state has done what we have done. We are once again the nation's vanguard for social progress, and you should feel good and proud about that accomplishment. And my friends, you should feel confident in our ability to govern and to do what many people believe can't be done because you have done it over and over and over again. And we have been told over and over and over again, we can't do it, it's too hard. But we did it and we will need that confidence because 2018, may be the toughest year New York has faced in modern political history. And the job you're going to have to do may be the job that the hardest job done by any legislative body to sit in modern political history. We have unprecedented challenges ahead on every level. And with these challenges at this moment, it requires stark candor and bold action. We're facing a three-front war. First, we have the old challenges of discrimination and sexism that have plagued society for years, but have recently been exposed for their prevalence and their virulence. Society has rightly expressed its outrage, but outrage is not enough. Enlightened government must seize the moment to attack these social diseases that are long institutionalized and culturalized and end them once and for all. Women and minorities still face abuse and prejudice. We must acknowledge it, stamp it out, and we must stamp it out here and now. Second, second we face new challenges threatening our safety and quality of life. Terrorism, climate change, environmental threats, including to our drinking water the growing opioid epidemic, a scourge that has claimed 3,000 lives just last year. And lastly, we have federal and economic challenges never experienced before. They threaten the essence of our economy. Short term, we have a $4 billion deficit and $2 billion in cuts in federal aid. Even more challenging long term, our federal government has hurt our state's economic position, both nationally and internationally. 
by taxing our state and local taxes, they made us less competitive. And they are helping other states at our expense. They are continuing their divisive politics and evolving it into an even more divisive governing. Just think about it. While well, we here in this state together have been working for economic, so, economic and social progress, our federal government is working to roll back so much of what we have done. They're trying to roll back New York's position as an economic leader. They're trying to roll back a woman's right to choose. They're trying to roll back environmental protection. They're trying to roll back health care for the poor, to roll back access to college loans, to roll back LGBTQ rights, to roll back labor's right to organize, to roll back our historic tax cuts that we have done over these past seven years. And with DACA, to roll back an immigrant child's opportunity to be an American, we cannot, we must not let those things happen in the great state of New York. Let us start our agenda by addressing the first challenge first, the old, ugly, persistent problems of sexism, racism, and homelessness. The most important element of New York's social process agenda is equality. It is guaranteed by the Constitution and our belief in human rights. Our country is finally taking a long look in the mirror as to how we treat women, and we are disgusted with what we see, and we should be. Our challenge is to now turn society's revulsion into reform. Carpe diem, to seize the day, to learn, to grow, to change. That's what we did with gun violence after Sandy Hook. That's what we did with sexual assault on college campuses. That's what we should do now after the exposure of the abuse of the women in this society. New York should lead the way once again, and we will. I begin, I, begin, I begin again by proposing that no taxpayer funds should be used to pay for any public official sexual harassment or misconduct, period. It is the bad act of the individual. Let the individual pay. I propose that no state or local government enter into a secret non-disclosure agreement. We can protect... We can protect a victim's identity and privacy, but the taxpayers have a right to know that that agreement exists and that their funds were used to pay for that agreement. I propose that any companies that do business with the state disclose the number of sexual harassment adjudications they have had and the number of non-disclosure agreements they have executed. I propose that the state of New York pension funds only be invested in companies that the controller determines have adequate female and minority representation in management or on the board of directors to constitute good corporate leadership. Personally, I believe a company cannot have good management by definition if it effectively excludes women and minorities. I propose the legislature enact the Contraceptive Care Act and finally, finally, finally pass Roe v. Wade. All right, and that's going to do it for us on News Now, but the stream does continue on fox10phoenix.com. I'm Mike Page. Have a great Wednesday. So victims are free to communicate complaints without fear of retaliation.
And I propose that we really seize the opportunity. All right, everybody, you are taking a live look here of the U.S. Senate floor. Coming up next, Pilar Arias. All right, folks, so what we will do is uh, we're going to do some uh, live stream and maintenance. We'll be back a little bit later.